We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Andre, and I'm here with Rob H. This is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. Uh, I should have cleaned my glasses before we started, and Tom should have had some coffee. But here we are on a Tuesday evening. <laughs> what is it about uh, yeah. my face that immediately starts itching the second we start recording this thing? I swear. Nervousness. Like, oh, it's not nervous. I'm sure I'm after nervous. 686 previous episodes, you're just all a Twitter. I'm a, I'm a, my stomach's a flutter. That's right. I have to, I vomit before every podcast because I'm so nervous. <laughs> if you, if you didn't, then your heart's not in it anymore. That's, that's how you know. Uh huh. Rob, Rob, we have a problem. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Oh, man. Welcome to AV Rant. This is the podcast that answers your home theater and AV questions. To get your questions answered, all I have to do is ask us by emailing us at question at avrant.com. You can go to www.avrant.com. Leave us a comment there. Facebook.com slash avrantpodcast. YouTube.com slash avrant to see our videos and not comment because YouTube is awful. Yeah. I won't let you. Call them like you see them. <laughs> yeah. Let's see here. Uh, contact us directly, Rob at avrant.com. His Twitter is at first reflect. I'm Tom at avrant.com. My Twitter is at avrant underscore Tom. And I set up 90% of the SVS speakers. Ah, very good. I set good. up everything but the stuff I had to attach to the ceiling. Let's see, 90% <laughs> out of nine. That's that's not a whole number, but no. it's pretty close. So I <laughs> got, was it just nine? No, seven. Yeah. Eight, you... nine. Yes, it is nine. Yeah, yeah you're right. Because you already had two previously. So yeah, first impressions. If you keep people are interested in that, so it, to, as a reminder, I've got ultras up front. The three front speakers are ultras. The all the rest of the speakers on the floor level are the book, not bookshelf, satellites, which are smallish. I I love them mm-hmm. because of their size, but they're not, I wouldn't call them small. Mm. We'll call them smallish. And then I got uh, two uh, two more prime elevation speakers for my top middles that I haven't installed yet because ah. the didn't want to. Yeah. Well, it also <laughs> means taking rest. down the birds, which, I mean, it's not super difficult, but it's not nothing. They're on it's your It's three ceilings. screws. I yeah. mean, yeah, it's three screws and it's a loosening of a Allen wrench mm-hmm. thing to because the speakers are completely tilted so that they're I'll be kind of down. interested to hear what, what the difference is between having birds that were right on the ceiling aiming straight down versus are you putting your prime elevations high on your sides and angled down or are you going to mount them to your ceiling? Uh... So I think so. My couch is pushed all the way up to one wall. Mm-hmm. So the one it's the side that's on the one wall, mm-hmm. I'm thinking I'm going to put it on the ceiling as close to the wall mm. as I can because that makes the angle yeah. shallower. So on the ceiling, uh, but kind of angled in a little bit is how the yeah. angle would work on a prime elevation. All right. Yeah, yeah. And the other one, I thought, it, it, you know, there's a walkway and like a doorway. I thought I might put it above the door mm-hmm. uh, in a regular orientation. Mm. Interesting. To see you know, because that would kind of whatever. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, clear. I'm going from the Veris Grand uh, Generation 1. First generation Veris Grand speakers. I don't know how much they've changed look-wise since... Looks-wise, not very much. Those are Aperion yeah. audio, by the way, yeah. for people who might not know. The Veris Grands are from Aperion. And yeah, yeah looks-wise, they're about the same, but they've changed the drivers and the crossover uh, twice now. They're on the version 3 at this point. Right. So... Uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to switch speakers in general is because I was sick of tower speakers mm. and I was mad at them. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 it, only in this room have I had a problem with them, but in this room I could not. I had a problem getting in the image. I've talked about mm. it before and I've kind of got it sorted out mm. and everything was fine. Uh, but they just, I, I just didn't want tower speakers. Mm-hmm. I was just sick of tower speakers. Now, if you're going on pure aesthetics, the Perian hands down are better looking uh-huh. than okay you, i've i've got uh i've got the ash black. they told me you know, do, you, do you want the gloss black or the ash i'm like i don't care mm. <laughs> don't care what they look like <laughs> i don't care so the ash black is just like the vinyl wrap or whatever yeah. it is and then there's the gloss black that you can get some people care one way or the other but shape wise mm-hmm. the varus are just a better looking speaker okay. they got rounded corners you know the the, the 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 front the center channel has like these two 
like uh, they're sort of like door stops but curved. So when right. you put the curved speaker on the curved door stop, you can angle it yeah. perfectly the way um, you want. Little and, cradles almost. Yeah. yeah. And, but you, they're, they look like door stops because mm. they're they're separate. There's no other thing. Uh, you know the I would describe the uh, all of the SVS speakers as mildly trapezoidal. There is slightly yeah, there's a smaller little at the bit top. of like beveling <laughs> on some of the corners, so it's not a full ninety degree corner on the front. Yeah, side. so there's a there's a they're a little bit narrow in the top, and then they have a, usually a little bit of a the the front where the front corner would be is is got a cut off mm-hmm. on it at an angle sort of whatever uh so but basically a box uh the center channel is basically a box mm-hmm. uh, it has a little bit of that and uh you, know, you can't aim it in any way not without actually buying door stops one supposes i did install our loudspeaker decoupling risers okay <laughs> on all of all of these speakers nice so the downside, by the way, for two ninety nine ninety nine, uh, you can get some yourself from us. Uh, the downside, I will tell you right now, is they're a little slippery. <laughs> as uh, as mouse as, pads are wont to be. As mouse pads that's, are wont to be. That's what we're talking about, by the way, because it's been a long time since we've talked about the AV Rant speaker decoupling pads, which which are of course mouse pads. That is, that they're is what just they mouse are. pads. Yeah, that's what they are. Mm-hmm. They're a little slippery, mm-hmm. so I'm a little concerned about that part of it. I mm-hmm. might uninstall them and reinstall the little rubber feet that come with the stands. Yeah. Uh, and just use those instead. But uh, overall, you know, it, it, as far as imaging goes, and you know, soundstage and stuff like that, setting these things up was you know easy. I did the Odyssey. Odyssey decided one of my speakers was wired out of phase. I yep. didn't think it was, but maybe it was. So <laughs> probably not. I I switched the wires, and it said it was fine. I reran oh. it, still said it was fine. I switched and hmm. reran it, still said it was fine. So I'm like, okay. Oh, maybe so, so I wasn't convinced. Mm-hmm. I wasn't convinced. So I put on a two channel uh, song that I know has a left right pan, and if you're out of phase, mm-hmm. that ain't gonna happen. That's right. N- not even a little bit. So it totally happened. And in fact, not only that, these were the 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 ultras up front just imaged like a gangbusters. Oh, it was nice. crazy. Oh, were, so instantaneously you are uh, you are happier with the results I, here. I am instantaneously happy. Not only that, I, I didn't even really. I just kind of like, yeah, I put my hand on top and kind of saw, saw, you know, like where the where it was generally pointed right, right. at. And I was Eyeballed like, it. yeah, that looks like it's about the side of the couch. And mm-hmm. this other one is a little about the side of the couch. Whatever, it's fine. <laughs> so I sat dead center like I'm supposed to, and. Uh, you know, they just image really, really well. So I was very, very happy with awesome. that. You know, the whole Phantom Center was beautiful, dead on, no problems whatsoever. I, I could tweak it a little bit. I could, I think I could probably play with it a little bit, and I will eventually, but uh, really happy. Really happy. They're, Great. you know, well boxed. They had, you know, they had all the stuff that you're looking for. So, I mean, I don't really remember how much these speakers are for the bookshelves. Do you know uh, how much they bookshelves, are? Bookshelves, uh, let's see. The bookshelves, I think, are a 1000 for the pair. Is that... Am I in the ballpark That's, there? I think they're a thousand for the pair for the I'm, bookshelf. I'm clicking on them right now. Yeah. Hold so I should mention the SVS Ultras. Uh, the finish on those actually is real wood. So uh, is it really? Yeah. Yep. The the black oak on the Ultras is real wood. On the Primes, I don't think it's real wood. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, they're five hundred dollars a pop. Five hundred dollars each, a thousand dollars a pair. Yeah. Okay. Oh wait, is it different for the the uh, black oak veneer? No. No, that's yeah, they're, they're, they're the same all the way around. There's a white yeah. gloss as well. Uh. The tweeters have all got covers over the top of them, little grills, which is for those of you that are mm-hmm. concerned, concerned about such things, that's always kind of nice. Uh, they all come with uh, uh, grill, you know, covers and stuff if you want to put them on. Regular speaker grill covers, yeah. yeah. I'm putting mine on mm-hmm. uh, just because of the dog more than, <laughs> more than anything. Right. But whatever. So, yeah, I'm real happy. So far, I'm extremely happy with them. Great. So, my family hasn't noticed at all. Nope. Because why would they? <laughs> Yeah. I won't call this the review. I'll call this the preview. All right. This is uh, so this, impressions. First impressions. First impression. This first is literally, I, I, I set them up. I stuck in the, the CD. I switched it. You know, did the thing that Rob says. You know, you press the game mm-hmm. thing mm-hmm. until it gives you stereo. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, just listen to that imaging. I was getting sounds from 360 degrees of me. I mean, Sweet. all the way around with the back of my head. And I was not listening to... I was listening to something that was made to do that. So it was very nice. Any, I, I, I was uh, very impressed. Any initial impression of going to monopole direct firing surround speakers versus you used to be using bipoles? 
not off the top of my head, but mm. the thing that's nice is because these are so physically smaller. That, right. And we're talking about the satellites now. Physically smaller. I've got shelves that were big enough to uh, comp, uh, uh, yeah. to, to put an entire, you know, full-fledged bookshelf on, like mm -hmm. a heavy bookshelf if I wanted to. Uh, so my surround backs, which are on one big long shelf, I was able to separate them out. So I'm getting mm. probably a good foot mm -hmm. additional between them for my surround backs. And then my surrounds, I'm actually able to, you know, bring them forward about three or four inches because they're so much smaller than the uh, yeah, yeah. Emotivas that they, they replaced. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm extremely happy with all of that. So it's just a matter of, uh, you know, getting these things, you know, sort of dialed in and making yeah. sure that everything, but it, it, it all looked really good as far as the, um, uh, the measurements and mm -hmm. stuff like that right off the bat all looked really good. So and it sounds pretty good. So I stuck in the, the two channel thing so I could hear the, the pan and make sure that I was actually out of phase and it had fixed it. And then I took and got, uh, the DVD, the, the Blu-ray, Ultra HD, whatever it is. The one that, the, the it's got to be Ultra HD. The new uh, mix of Jurassic Park. Yeah, that'd be Ultra HD. Of that. yep. Yeah, okay. yeah. And that was, you know, of course, phenomenal. So that sounded great. But I'm going to have to spend a little bit more time with it. I am planning on watching a lot of horror movies coming up. Mm -hmm. And horror movies, more than anything, love to use surrounds and Oh, surround they backs. sure do, yes. So I've got Us, which I haven't watched yet. Oh, yeah, uh, that's pretty good. Which is supposed to be pretty good. And uh, I just started walking, watching Lock and Key on Netflix, mm -hmm. which I'm not really sure if that's an Atmos or anything, but whatever, that seems to be all right right now. I'm at the end of the first episode, and it just got real freaky. So, <laughs> you know, I, anything that builds itself as having Lovecraftian overtones has got my attention. I'm a huge Lovecraft fan, even though he was super racist. But mm. let's uh, talk about uh, our listeners of the week let's as we shout. go on to this podcast. So to become a listener of the week, all I have to do is support the podcast in some way. One of the ways you can do that is going to patreon.com slash podcast and signing up. This is a subscription service where you subscribe to content creators of your choice. You can subscribe for as little as a dollar a month to your favorite content creator or as much as you want on top of that. So a dollar is the minimum. So uh, we have 108 people that have done that, and we thank all 108 of you. Thank you very much, gentlemen Indeed. and ladies. Indeed, that is patreon.com slash podcast, and thanks so much to our 108 patrons over there. And if you can support us financially, feel free to support us in any way you can think of, one of the ways that you can think of doing it. You know, I haven't said this in a while, but if you leave us a review someplace... <laughs> That'd be super. Oh, yeah. iTunes is always a good place for mm -hmm. that, but there's other places. I don't know where, I'm sure. But whatever, you, wherever you listen to us at, leave us a review and let us know, and we'll mention you. But Chris uh, wanted to let us know that he talked us up to SVS after, I guess, his purchase, I suppose. Yep. He must have purchased There something. was a purchase. So thank you, Chris, for talking us up to SVS. Definitely, Chris. Thanks so much for talking us up like that. Did want to mention, uh, got some stuff that will definitely be listeners of the week next week, but I cut everything okay. off on Sunday nights. So everything that happened uh, later than Sunday night, you'll be mentioned next week. Please don't worry. <laughs> so one thing I will mention about last thing about the Ultra Bookshelf speakers is they're quite tall. Mm -hmm. So Rob and I last week after the podcast, we started talking about the, the height of speakers, uh, the stands I should get. Yeah. And, you know, rather than taking the speakers out of the boxes and measuring everything and being super pedantic about it, we sort of just guesstimated where the tweeter would be. <laughs> and we looked up the dimension of how tall I mean, the speaker I mean, yeah, is. but we were like kind of eyeballed it, yeah. right? So, uh, and I'm like, and I kind of, I got a tape measure and I kind of went, oh, I'm sitting about like this. So mm -hmm. I'm probably about this. And yeah, that's probably about right. So we went to San, I went to Sanus. Actually, I think I went to Amazon. But yeah. anyways, I, will, I looked at Sanus speakers they're steel series which is my favorite series that they have it's black industrial and functional they're not the easiest speak uh, speakers in to put together but you do it once and that's right. uh, once if you if you are unlike me and actually read the instructions it'll go much better for you than it did for <laughs> me because i always put them together and go this can't possibly be right and then i go and read the instructions so yeah but it, they went together pretty easily but uh 22 inches is what i ordered yes uh kind of guesstimating where the tweeter would be mm -hmm. uh when i am seated on my couch they are a little low oh okay the tweeter is a little low oh. but when i am reclined mm. they are perfect okay. so i will take i will take i will say as much as i i would love to just attribute every bit of the differences i'm hearing between the period and the uh mm. svs to just pure svs quality differences i think the fact that the tweeter is lower is 
at least partially responsible for Could how be. much more, more I'm liking the I mean, there game. shouldn't be anything blocking the sound from going upward from the tweeter because there's nothing above the tweeter on the SVS right, Pixel right. speaker. And it should actually be closer in height to where your center speaker tweeter is because your center speaker is below your screen. So right. everything is more in line. That's yeah, right. yeah. So there's a little bit of that going on too. But we'll see. When I get a chance to actually blow some movies out of this place, yeah. we'll... Uh, We'll, we'll hear some more. We'll be hearing about S- these SVS speakers for the, you know the foreseeable <laughs> future. So yeah, lock you know, lock in. I guess. Yeah. Or what is it? Strap in. That's what it is. All right. In the news here, LG Display is still the only manufacturer of large OLED OLED panels, and now their new factory in China is months behind schedule. And God knows how long it's going to be now that COVID nineteen. Well, that's is part of apparently this, yeah. the thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the line that was supposed to be up and running in October twenty nineteen has not produced a single OLED panel yet. The COVID nineteen outbreak is only further delaying things. So there's a good chance those anticipated forty eight inch OLEDs might not show up until late this year, if at all. And we shouldn't expect large price drops uh, this year for OLED TVs. Now I'm going to be honest with you guys and uh, all of our listeners and stuff uh, about this whole COVID nineteen thing. All right, my this is my uneducated uh, and in yes, if you're a, a, a medical professional, feel free to send me an angry email and I'll put it in the same place I put all the rest of them. But uh, I will read it before I do so. Uh, you know, I was at the supermarket today and there's a lady that walked in with with a face mask and I was just like, really? Well, <laughs> you know, that is yeah, that never does anything for a virus, but okay. Yeah, I just get I just get irritated because uh, there's real professionals out there who really need a lot of these supplies, and you know, like Costco's completely sold out of you know or uh, of, of hand sanitizer and everything else. I'm like, you know, if you spent five seconds online, you would see <laughs> that that COVID nineteen, while it is dangerous and extremely uh, contagious, yeah, for most of us it's going to be a couple of bad days or a couple of bad weeks and then we're going to be 81% okay. yeah. of confirmed cases are either no symptoms or very mild symptoms that you couldn't tell apart from a cold to be honest so yeah yeah but for the people so, for I, whom it's I, bad I mean, it's very I, not, bad so yeah and and that's what it's got me like and, I, and the only reason i wasn't like that guy who stops the lady and says why are you wearing that thing you're a terrible person blah 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 it's because she might actually have some sort of respiratory thing where you know, the who knows? This is Florida. Of, There's a lot of very sick people. The so. wearing of the little face mask, like the the kind that like your dentist would wear, which is not a filter or anything like that. No, uh, no, yeah. That is supposed to be for the people who are sick, so that if they do cough, their droplets don't go spraying out into the air. If you yeah. are not sick, it is not going to prevent you from getting sick at all. So, so I, I, I mean, <laughs> if you are out there and you're worried about that, all I ask is that you do a little research before you go out there and try to buy every face mask that you can get your hands on. <laughs> That's all I ask. That's all I ask. If you do that, then, you know, don't whatever. worry. Kid, In another two to three years after this has died away, there'll be another contagion going around because the news yeah. loves to spread the propaganda and they love to freak everybody out and the sales yeah. go crazy for a little while and the stock market goes insane and people short the market and make a ton of money and then the market comes back and they make a ton of money. And that's why we keep having these things because mm. a lot fewer people have this than the flu and the flu kills more people. So, yeah. <laughs> Scott Wilkinson wrote an article for Tech Hive about a recent double blind test to try and determine if 8K resolution truly looks better than 4K resolution video. 139 participants viewed 4K and 8K clips from either 5 feet or 9 feet away on an 80 inch, 88 inch 8K OLED, mm-hmm. 5 feet away from an 88 inch. They're they're trying to give you your best shot of seeing this. I'm saying that's pretty freaking close. That's all I'm going to say. Well, somewhere 9 feet away. The clips were labeled A and B, but sometimes A and B were actually identical to act as a control. Participants rated the A and the B clips on a seven-point scale to say whether A or B looked better or the same. Seven-point scale. Yes. Why, you need from... two points. You need three points. You need same, three points. Different. You know, which which one is the one you like that you think looks yeah. best? Or neither. Which ultimately is what they crunched it down to. But they have a scale that went from much better. Uh, better, somewhat better, same, somewhat better, the other side, better, the other side, much better, the other side. Yeah. Anyway, that's, that's what they did. But they crunched it down to three points anyway. That's all you needed was three points. <laughs> In the end, so drum roll, please. <laughs> Most of the time, the response was that they looked the same. Every clip had a fair number of responses that the 4K version looked better than the 8K version, but the 8K be- looking better than 4K was the second most popular response. Uh, one particular clip, which was na- nature footage shot on a native 8K camera by Stacy Spears. I'm sure that's somebody famous. I don't know who Spears it is. Spears and Munsell. That's the Spears from Spears oh, and Munsell. Oh, okay. 
Yeah. I uh, was the only one to get more 8K looks better than 4K responses than 8K and 4K look the same. So there's certainly no overwhelming response of 8K consistently looking better, even amongst participants with 20, 2010 vision sitting only five feet away. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, you know, th- this just backs up what I've been saying for uh, ever since 4K came out, which is we don't need it. We certainly don't need 8K. We didn't need 4K. Uh, we don't need 8K. And... Uh, <laughs> You know, the the reality is is if you are super careful about how you film everything, and you film it in a precise way with, a, with all the the best gear and everything else, and you play it back in the precise way, whatever. You, yes, you'll be able to tell the difference. That's what I t- took from this. That one AK one got consistent, a little bit more consistent. Well, even AKs there, even in that yeah. one, uh, the the majority of responses is the combination of 4k looked better and they looked the same overall yeah. more people said one of those two answers yeah. than 8k looked the same now individually out of those three possibilities 8k looked better was the one that got the most in that one clip right. <laughs> in all other clips they looked. i i wanted to see the re- they didn't break out the results at least in the report they didn't break out the results of when a and b were actually the exact same clip because that's the mm. one I wanted to see how many people were like, oh, A is clearly better than B, or B is clearly better than A. It's like, no, we know for a fact these were identical, yeah. the same clip. I wanted it, to see yeah. that that uh, report. So, it, you know, if, if this doesn't convince you that all these numbers, that it's just all BS, then I don't know what will. <laughs> I mean, it's not that these things aren't measured. And this this a lot of long ways goes towards our same argument we have about amplifiers and DACs and mm. everything else. It's like, yes, numerically. Sure. You can sh- you, objectively, this one is better than this one. You will not tell the difference, and that's where we are with video right now with AK and 4K. Now HDR is not the same thing. We're not talking about the same thing, but with just pu- pure pixels, we, it's it's we're at the we're at the point where it makes no difference. We can't see it. Very so much diminishing s- returns stop, at this point. Yes. Stop shoving it down our throats. I mean, you're sitting five. Who's sitting five feet away from the 80 inch display? Come on, no one's sitting that's five feet away from the 80 inch display. Seems uncommon to me. Thanks. Yeah. So some comments here. John just wanted to let us know that our, our recommendation first led him to getting a pair of SVS PB3000 subs for his irregularly shaped open concept room. He immediately said bravo to that upgrade. So good. But he was using the sub 1 and sub 2 outputs on his Yamaha receiver that treated them individually. So he added a Y splitter and gave Rob's 12 step guide, guide a try. In his setup, he says the results were uh, was a definite improvement. So he wanted to say thanks. It didn't make, him, make sense to him until we explained how multiple subwoofers plus the room are all active acting as a single base entity but now he's heard it for himself and he, so he's happy that we helped make his home theater more fun and satisfying hooray so, good yay yes good job john my my uh i have level matched my subs on a y splitter mm-hmm. and uh first they said it was too quiet and they said it was too loud and i told it to go <laughs> screw itself and i just ran i ran yep. odyssey anyways and it ran it at negative nine. Oh, so yeah. i'm like that's a little, yeah, they were a little hot, mm-hmm. but yeah, it, I mean, I know the bottom is negative 12, so you still had some room <laughs> there, so I'm fine. I'm just leaving it. Leave me alone. Way too lazy to run it again. <laughs> Carl wanted to let everyone know uh, about the huge amount of free, often obscure content available at archive.org's VHS Vault. Not everything that was on VHS made its way to DVD, so just like their efforts to archive internet web pages and books, archive.org is hosting digi- digitized versions of D- VHS recordings, and they're freely available t- for anyone to view. What could possibly be on there that I'd want to see that I <laughs> can't get in another format? That's uh-huh. what I'm wondering. Well, it's that it's free. You can just stream it there like youtube i mean uh right away i didn't scroll down very far but like the entire uh series of mash is on there and i i assume that is available on dvd but whatever they put it on there and like i think all of tiny tunes is on there so okay you know it doesn't seem to be in any kind of order other than i think it's in the order in which it was uploaded because it's certainly (laughs) not alphabetical (laughs) Yeah. And there's like exercise, Metadata, there's like hard exercise to... <laughs> videos and stuff on there. Like you want to go back to those old VHS exercise tapes. Jazzercise. They're making an archive of it. Good on them. Oh. Yeah. Well, somebody's got to do that, I suppose. Oh, I figured out my... I remember I was complaining about my DVD player having a weird aspect yeah. ratio or whatever. Yeah. It was the projector. Oh, okay. It was an anamorphic something. Yeah, it, it, any, it. Anything that came out that was mm. not 
16 by 9 or, you know, so already had it. Squishing it, everything from left to right? Yeah, yeah, it was squishing stuff. So, yeah. Expecting you to have a lens in front of it. I, I once I once I turned on uh, the receiver and had Odyssey engaged and I couldn't see the choices. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, something's wrong. Mm -hmm. It's not the DVD player, so I figured it out. Just press the aspect ratio button on my remote. Ah, there I was. That did it. DJ on Twitter, naturally, our comments last week regarding screen masking and how many times you'll actually end up using it did not line up with everyone's personal experience. And here comes that guy. <laughs> DJ says he always puts up his manual masking panels whenever he's watching a 2.35 to 1 movie. He even timed himself and it only takes him 45 seconds. So it's worth it to him for the perceived boost in contrast. There's always one. And DJ, honestly, dude, I know that I, I knew that you were there. I knew that you oh, were out there. I knew he was very good natured us. about it. Yeah, yeah. He wasn't do, doing it as a seriously upset or anything like that. No, 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 no Very no, good no. natured about it, but no. Yep. But I, fair yes, enough. You're absolutely right. There, it's always you know, there's people that <laughs> this is going to be important enough to. But right. There's so many more of us who, you know, get that feature on our car that we thought was so important <laughs> and then never ever use it. And I'm. I'm guilty of that a thousand times over. So when I was saying giving that advice, I was giving it to myself as much as I was giving it to anybody <laughs> else. Let's get on to the questions here. John. John's room was 12 feet wide and 21 feet long overall. But at the front of his room, there's a soffit that covers a stairway going upstairs. And then there are vertical bulkheads on the left and right sides. It basically makes a frame for the first three feet at the front of his room. Or it's like a large closet without doors, which is exactly what it looks like. Yes. Now, the, he has put his TV inside here. It looks like there might be two TVs in there. Uh, is that two TVs? No, that's a, no, that's that's a, a panel. That's, a, that's an acoustic panel, panel okay. for his center speaker. So he has put as many uh, acoustic panels in here as he can possibly fit because they're on, they're <laughs> everywhere. And then there's the TV in there and then there's a little cabinet and then his speakers are on stands which are almost outside of this uh, area or maybe yeah, flush with the front of it. Those are just towers. Yeah, and they're... Yeah, those are towers? They're oh, okay. ever, it's the... ever, ever so slightly proud of the, uh, the frame type of thing yeah. that's around here. But uh, yeah, more or less right in line with the edges of the... Where, where the doors would go if this were a closet. Think of it that way. Right. So he asks, if he goes upstairs and looks in the space under the stairway, it appears as though the vertical bulkheads aren't actually load bearing. Hey, let's just take a sledgehammer to it. It should be fine. <laughs> Don't to mm. put down the hammer. Okay, because that was that was that was tongue in cheek is how we call that. He's put his front speakers of his and his eighty four inch L C D TV in front of the sort of alcove along with several two inch absorption panels. He's never really liked the look and I don't blame you, dude. That looks kind of weird. And he doesn't like how it constrains his front, left, and right speaker placement options. His primary seat is about 12 feet from the physical front wall where his TV is mounted. A, should he look into hiring a contractor to remove the vertical bulkheads? If he can, if it can be done, it would open up the front of his room, which he has always wished he could do. Can I keep reading? Because <laughs> I kind of feel like I kind of feel like my 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 answer is going to answer like everything. Okay. All thing. right. Sure. Let's go. Because I I mean, first of all. You're more than welcome to talk to a contractor. To see if that's sure, I that, that I have zero do. problem with someone coming in and examining it. I am assuming that, like the way he described it, I think that if you look at like the left hand side, because um, I think that's the way he said the stairs were going up was from like left to right. Yeah. If you look at the left hand side, I think if you were to take out the vertical bulkhead on the left hand side, there's probably like a little bit of the stairs on the angle that's coming mm. through there. And I suspect that's why they put that in and then just put the one on the other side just to equal the look. Or maybe somebody planned this to be a closet at some point and they just never installed the doors. It, it could just be that. Um, right. But yeah, I mean, having it examined by a contractor, sure. I just, I wouldn't I, tell them to knock it down until it's been properly examined. I would never have installed this TV on this back wall. Mm. I would, I would have uh, taken that piece of furniture or some other piece of furniture. I would have put it in front of, sure, like as if, as if there were a door there, as if that were a, that, that doorway was actually a full wall. Right. Okay. I would have put all that stuff in front of there and clean your speakers, which makes your speakers a little wide. Now there is a door on the right. Mm -hmm. Could make this a little tight on that side could be mm. i don't know if that's that's part of your issue but i would have put some sort of screen or masking material or just anything you know to cover this doorway like a mm. you know you could literally just take uh 
like speaker girl cloth and hang it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, you, would, oh, you could just you put curtains. Really that. Curtains could just go put across curtains there. there. Yeah. I would put all my gear and every bit of right. insulation I could find back into there. that alcove back there. And this TV would be on the stand and the, t- the speakers would be in front of all this thing. And I would just, I would pretend that wasn't there. Yeah. Cause you could get one of those three in one TV stands so yeah. that it, you know, cause it looks like he wants his TV a bit higher than just the way right. its own foot would work on a normal TV's pedestal. Uh, but yeah, you get one of those three in one TV stands with the stock that comes up on the back and holds your TV mm-hmm. just like a wall mount. And then you can put the TV anywhere you want, anywhere that that stand can stand. Yeah. And it, it, he's sitting 12 feet away from an 80 inch display. Well, I wouldn't want to sit or 80. 84 Four inch. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't want to sit five feet away from it. I certainly don't. But now you could be nine feet, feet, feet away from it, from it and that'd <laughs> yeah. be very nice. Yeah. Then nine feet would be, I think that that fixes a lot of yeah. all the rest Everything. of his issues. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that's what I would do. Okay. <laughs> that's what I would do. I'd move everything out of this closet and just put up a curtain or something. So, uh, Second question, if the vertical bulkheads have to stay, what do we think about hanging a motorized projection screen in the opening? Man, just, I wouldn't. I would put it in front of the opening. Yeah. I wouldn't put it in the opening, that's for <laughs> sure. I wouldn't try to make it, like, framed. I just have it, pretend this thing doesn't exist. <laughs> just put a curtain back there. Actually, I, th- I think that's, like, all of it, because, I mean, he yeah. was saying, like, if he does put the motorized screen, like, either in the opening or just in front of the opening, now he's only nine feet away from a much bigger screen. I'm like, if you're nine feet away from your 84-inch, you're, like, exactly where you want to be. So I think the only thing you need to buy is a three-in-one TV stand. Yeah. And, and and you're done. You got everything you wanted just with a TV stand. I think that's the solution. Yeah. So um, that'll allow you to bring your front left and right speakers forward, which he was asking about. And yeah, it takes care of all the screen size concerns. You can keep the lights on like you wanted to do. TV yeah, stand mean, is the solution. We win. This is like a like a $300. Yeah. Like if you buy a real nice a one real from nice Sandus one, yeah. or something like that, you know, two, three hundred bucks. Bob Trump. I like a of. company called Z-Line. They make yeah. very decent and affordable, but nice looking and very functional and very stable three in one TV stands. Yeah. Sounds good. <laughs> RD. Two weeks ago, Rob ta- tackled oh, that must have been with the solo week. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, Rob tackled RD's question about potentially replacing his NXG brand in wall speakers, which RD described as sounding not terrible, mm-hmm. which is what we're going for. It's like that's sometimes how I describe my children, <laughs> <laughs> fortunately. Let's say, Rob, you and I, after this podcast, have to have a little heart to heart because I'm like pulling my hair out over here about my kids. I'm so freaking stressed. It's not even funny. But, uh, and those of you who have children and some of them are teenagers and you're not like shaking your head going, been there. Mm. Yep, been there. Do you have younger children? Like, oh, my kids are beautiful. They're going to be wonderful their entire lives. Yeah. I'll be here for you when they hit 16. Just watch Thank Big Mouth. That hormone monster is going to kick in. Oh, my God. I love that show so much. It's so terrible. <laughs> it is so funny. All right. Uh, I described his speakers as not terrible. Rob stressed that for RD setup, if he was going to stick with in-wall front speakers, that he'd want speakers with backer boxes. Or RD ended up finding an installer who was selling off some GTL Sound Labs in-walls. I never heard of them. Yeah. In-wall speakers that normally go for $1,200 a piece. I guess they must be good. I guess. They're already a sealed design with full back enclosure, so RD is happy with that find. He's using a Denon X3600H receiver. It's rated 105 watts per channel. The GTL speakers are spec to handle 175 watts. How big is this room? He hasn't told us. Okay. It's uh, R- it's very open and all that, but he's not sitting super far away. Yeah. Okay. RD was going to need at least two channels of external amplifications to expand his, uh, to his desired 7.2.4 configuration. So do we think he should get three channels to power his front speak- three speakers instead? He's about 10 to 11 feet away from his front wall, but it's a very large, wide open room. Outlaw Audio selling three of their two- <laughs> 2200 mono blocks for $800. That's a limited time special. That's less than the monolith or Emotiva three channel model. Should he, should he hop on that Outlaw deal? You're going to hate me. <laughs> Because I'm going to say no. <laughs> but uh, you, because I, hey, I have been down the rabbit hole of yes, amplifiers. Yes, yes. I have been down it so many times and it starts so simply. It starts with Dayton Audio and you're like, for a hundred bucks, I can get two channels and I'm done. 
yeah. I don't really want just 50, 50 watts per channel on my front speakers. Mm. So, I mean, if I'm going to buy two, I might as well buy three. But I don't want 50 <laughs> watts. I want at least 100. So, what can I, well, maybe I look, oh, look, there's this deal over here. You know what I should get? I should get a seven channel. I might, well, if I'm going to do three, I might as well do five. If I'm going to do five, I might as well do seven. So, I'm going to get a seven channel amp for the bottom. And, you know, I mean, the the, the emotivas are great, but the monolith is only a couple hundred dollars more. <laughs> and look at the bill quality. That's made by ATI. You it know, is. that's going to be. All right. Just get the two-channel amp for your top middles and mm. just call it a day. <laughs> that's kind of what I'm going to say. I'm sorry, I mean, but you, that's you, what I'm going to say. You really don't need the three mono yeah. blocks uh, when you're only 10 to 11 feet away. And and I looked up the specs on those new in-wall speakers that you have, and they're entirely normal efficiency. I think they're 89 dB per one watt, okay. and they're 8-ohm speakers. Like There's absolutely no problem with your X3600 powering those. We're not right. talking about bass, where you have to pressurize the entire open space. We're talking about the direct path from the speaker to you, which is only about 11 feet. So uh, objectively, you don't need it. The difference between 105 watts and 175 watts is, uh, let's see, about two decibels. So <laughs> if you had 200 watt amplifiers, they could theoretically make those speakers play three decibels louder than the Denon can, you know, sort of maxed out. But yeah, you're, you're not going to need that. That's uh, objectively not what you need. Now, I would go as far as to say that if you went and got Outlaw's Model 5000, which is a five channel amplifier, but it's only $650, that I'm not going to, I'm not going to be mad at that. You know, you power your five speakers. You take even more load off of your, off of your uh, Denon. You know that 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 I could kind of get behind. Um, that's as that's as I far mean, as I will go. Six hundred fifty. I, I, I I'm never gonna get mad at anybody for buying the amplifier. That's right. I mean, because I mean, amplifier <laughs> is one of the few pieces of gear that you can buy that almost never goes away. Yeah. You know, almost never breaks. I this is coming from a man who's actually got had an amplifier break on them, which. <laughs> irritated me but they almost never break and they last kind of forever so it's one of the few pieces of gear that you can kind of just impulse buy and and it'll you can use it for uh, mm -hmm. you know just about ever if you really want to that being said you don't need it <laughs> you don't need any of you it you don't you just need, need it the two channels but yeah. if you're gonna do it i say 650 is the most you should spend on a model 5000 there all right Dan. Dan has gotten used to looking at some pretty expensive home theater gear. When it came to subwoofers, he went, per, went to some pretty high-end installers and dealers, and he was looking at options like Velodyne's uh, Digital Drive Plus series, which is DD Plus, uh, REL, and JL Audio. He wound up bringing home a pair of JL Audio Fathom subs, mm -hmm. which are like, what, five grand a pair? A, pay, a piece? I, I mean? think that's five the grand. smallest one starts about there, and I, well, I don't so even... Fathom, the Fathoms are the... Yeah, the F. They, so they've got the... Uh, the Gothams, e which are the big ones, right? And then Fathoms. The Gotham is the very top one. That's the dual driver. No, the E's are $1,000 each. I know that. The E's okay. are 1000 unless they've gone up. So I think the Fathoms were 5000 and the Gothams were ten. I, I might be wrong I don't remember that. exactly. But anyway, they are not cheap. We know they are not yeah. cheap. Yes. Anyways, they might be double or triple what I just said. So <laughs> whatever. We don't know. Uh, so you end up bringing home some JL Audio Fathom subs, but they are still in the audition phase and he isn't committed to buy them outright just yet. Listening to us, naturally he's heard us recommend SVS, but SVS doesn't have any offerings at the same sort of prices. That's why we recommend them, but let's just continue <laughs> on. Hey, by the way, let, before we even say anything else, I would love to have some JL Audio Fathom oh, subs. Oh, I, I, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not angry at anybody going, hey, these Fathoms <laughs> sound really darn good. And look at those are some how compact they are. Subs. Yeah. yeah, they're tiny. Yeah, you're paying. You're you're not paying for nothing. Like mm -hmm. there's some subs you feel. I feel like you're just paying for you know looks or you know name or whatever. Nah. Not with JL Audio. You're paying for something. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you're getting a little bit of name and a little bit of looks, but, you know, there is an amplifier and a driver in there that is seriously beefy. So I, I had no problem with that. So what has stood out to him with the JL Audio Fathom subs is their transient response. Things sound uh, absolutely flawless and real. There's no overhang at all. And something like a kick drum has an uncanny realism to it now that he's never uh, now that he's never really heard in his home system before. We have no idea what he had before. He's willing to pay the price for the JL Audio subs, but now that he's heard this level of performance, he wouldn't want anything less. But is there any chance that something from SVS could equal this level of performance? To him, the price savings seems almost too good to be true. So would we say this is the case? 
too good to be true. No, I wouldn't say. No, 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 definitely not that. Uh, I think there's a very simple solution to this. Which, oh, I mean, FCS has free shipping both ways. Free shipping ways, so both that, ways. <laughs> that, there's, there's your, now, that's your, that's the true answer, but I think we should still give our opinion. Oh, well, I mean, I, I, I'm like, here, here's what I think you should do. I think you should stick with ste- sealed because okay. uh, if, if you're all about the tight transient response, there is some mechanical benefit to a sealed enclosure when it comes to tight transient response. That is just the way it is. So I would stick with sealed, but I would go ahead because of the type of price range that you're willing to consider and get SVS's flagship, get an SB16 Ultra, the sealed box 16 Ultra. Get get two of them because you if you if they don't equal up to your fathoms or for whatever reason, you still prefer the Fathoms, you send them back to SVS, you are not out a penny. They pay the shipping back, they pay the shipping to you, they give you the full refund if you send them back. And why even bother with anything other than the flagship, given that the flagship doesn't even cost as much as what you're already considering. And if the SB16 Ultras don't float your boat, then SVS is not for you, because that's as good as their sealed subs get. And... I, I think that's it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what else I would suggest doing in this case. Yeah? Because there's no risk. You're it for yourself. Yeah. Compare them yeah, head yeah, to yeah, head. Yeah. A, B, switch them. I'm looking at, and it, 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 the, the like use of these things are four grand. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 Each. I mean, yeah, I honestly think that like a sealed 3000 series, you know, would probably stack up pretty well too. But I think Rob's right. If you're going to be looking at this price range, you you know, I don't think that price necessitates better performance, you know, right. consistently. You, you can't, there are brands like R, uh, RBH is a brand. If you pay more RBH, you're getting more performance, like every time, not sometimes, every time. You're getting better performance. Well, and every time. as you go up in SVS's lineup, there is ob- objectively, there's no question they get louder and play lower. That is that's measurable, right. is exact, and yeah. easy to prove. So, but, I mean, you could look at the specs of the the Fathom that right. you, which whichever one you have, and match it up to the SVS mm-hmm. one that has that same one, that same uh, you know response rate, and then try to get something similar, or you could just buy the flagship and still spend less. Yeah. Because, so, I mean, if go. if they didn't have the free two-way shipping, well, then there's some value in us offering an opinion of what, we're, what we think the result is going to be. But it's like, it doesn't even matter what we say in this case, because yeah. th- there is no question you can afford them. And if the flagship isn't good enough, then it, then nothing in SVS's lineup is going to be I would enough. just co- co- late, co- co-locate them. Yeah, I, oh, yeah. Wherever your Fathoms are, st- I mean, I don't remember. The, I think the well, Fathoms, the fathoms are, are smaller top. than the 16 Ultras. So Yeah, so put the 16s on the bottom, the Fathoms on top, yeah. you know, play Stack a one, them. and then switch them out, and then play the other one, switch them out. Definitely. <laughs> you know what I mean? Bob's your uncle. Yeah. Joe. Some updates. We went through two of Joe's previous questions. He was asking if there was a way to have his Marantz automatically play soundtracks as their native form uh, format since using the auto listening mode applied to Nut Mixer by default. Mm-hmm. And he was asking why the Ultra HD Blu-ray player, uh, Blu-ray of Ready Player One defaulted to DTS Neural X when it says it has an Atmos soundtrack. Rob asked if maybe Joe had put the regular 1080p Blu-ray of Ready Player One by accident instead of the... Ultra. Because they're Ultra both in HD the case, one. and very often you yeah. open the case, and the one that's in the front section there is the Blu-ray, and the Ultra HD Blu-ray I is the one it. on the left underneath the little thing that has the digital code printed on it. I've had that I, I, I don't understand how, why some of these discs, like, you literally cannot tell which one's which. <laughs> they, they, oh, it's, it's like written one's on there Like, one's blue somewhere. and one's red, yeah. and, and it's all stylized, and there's no... You, you have to go hunting for the Ultra HD logo someplace on it, and you certainly can't do it in a dark room. That's right. Uh, it just a- that's why I said so there's no blame if someone has accidentally put in the Blu-ray yeah. instead of the Ultra HD Blu-ray because it's super. You're going to assume the one on the right hand side. But as soon as you open the thing, that's going to be the 4K. But the good one. Not always. Yeah. I've had it myself, yeah. but that wasn't it. That wasn't the case. Yeah, it turns out that the 4K disc defaults to DTS HD Master Audio, and you have to go into the disc sound menu and manually select Atmos. Why on earth would they do that? Because <laughs> they do. I, uh, I, 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 root- I, and I've always, I've been trained to do this since mm. the days of DTS on DVD. Yep. You know, the, the D- it would almost never default to DTS. It would always be Dolby Digital or whatever, and you'd have to go into the sound menu. So I always go into well, the languages. The Blu-ray of The Dark Knight, uh, that one defaults to 
vanilla Dolby Digital 5.1, you have to go into the sound <laughs> menu and select Dolby True HD. Dolby True HD 7.1 is there on the Blu-ray disc of The Dark Knight, but not by default. By default, it just plays the lossy Dolby Digital version. There, I don't know why some discs are authored that way. I have no good answer for you, but yeah. uh, that, that was the case with Ready Player One. Strange. So he began the process of, of manually setting his desired listening mode for each signal type on, on his uh, on each of his inputs as they come in. It's all a bit tedious, but we set, as we said, once he has done it, the Marantz does remember and it's working out all right. Yeah. But after manually sl- sl- setting DTS HD Master Audio to play DTS HD Master Audio listening mode instead of DTS HD Plus Neural X, he knows that his Marantz uh, info menu still shows his top middle speakers as being active. Uh, the front panel of his Marantz also has the top middle light, uh, light lit up. His uh, Panasonic player is using the audio setting that we suggested. So what is going on here? I'm, yeah, this was an I interesting one. This was a I very, it got me to look at my own system because okay. I, I, um, Marantz. I also have a Marantz and I always use an up mixer. I always use Neural X because I want my front wide speakers to be active. So I hadn't even really noticed this, but... I first of all replicated his setup. I went back into my, uh, you know, um, amp- amplifier assign menu, and I said I've only got seven speakers, and I've got five on the floor, and I've got two top middles, and I put in. So I tried to replicate a lot of what he did. I don't have Ready Player One on Ultra HD Blu-ray, but I have another disc that has both Atmos and DTS HD Master Audio as two available tracks, and that is uh, Blade Runner 2049 on Ultra HD Mm Blu-ray. Now, that one defaults to playing Atmos, but if you go into the sound setting menu of the disc itself, you can choose DTS HD Master Audio instead. So I did all that, and my Marantz SR7010 showed the exact same thing. It showed that it was playing in DTS HD Master uh, sound listening mode, that the signal was DTS HD Master Audio, a 5.1 signal, but that the top middle speakers were active in my system. And Was anything coming out of the front, them, though? Well, that's, that's what I tested. In fact, I went to the extreme of unplugging everything else except for the speakers that were wired to the top middle, and they are dead silent. There is no sound coming out of those top middle speakers. And as soon as I put it into DTS HD plus Neural X mode, then plenty of sound was coming out of the top middle speakers. So I knew that they were wired and that those speakers work. Now, when I put my system back to what I have, which is um, seven speakers on the floor, five normal plus front wides, and then front heights and rear heights, uh, yet again on mine, it showed that all 11 speakers were active in the graphic but nothing, no sound was coming out of any more than the five normal speakers. So my only conclusion is that this is basically a glitch. It's, it's a mistake in the programming of how the display, lo- you know, this is pressing the info menu button on your Marantz remote, right, right, or, right. but it also is on the front panel, that, that little flat below the flip down display on the Marantz, there's the front panel and it does light up all the lights. It says all of your speakers are outputting sound, but in fact, only the 5.1 that adhere to the original signal are actually making any sound. So yeah. it's basically a glitch. Uh, I, I, thanks for bringing it to my attention because I, I wouldn't have noticed it because I always use an up mixer anyway and I expect all of my speakers to show as active. Right. That's interesting. Yeah, that that would have, my guess was that, you know, that it was saying all, you know, as, tar, as part of DTS, HD, you know, Master Audio and everything else that these are speakers that could be giving back sound, but they're, <laughs> you know they're not because if you look at it it's uh they're white um, are they always white like that or are they sometimes the orange color um white being like in the info the, menu it, one on the info on the button uh, so yeah, on, on the, the info on... menu one only things that are orange are active and everything else is like what is possible but not actually active if it's active then it'll be orange in the info menu right. display yeah, interesting that it's, it's yeah. That it's well, I mean, that. it's very, like very people who got that monoprice HTP one processor, they pointed out how yeah. <laughs> if you were running a seven point one point four speaker system and you were playing something in actual Atmos or DTS X, that the front panel read out eight point one point four, no matter what you did. <laughs> and so people wrote back to monoprice. They're like, literally, someone had like put the wrong number in the code, like the wrong digit in the code. <laughs> 
Like it was like the simplest of programming errors. They hit an eight instead of a seven. So that right. anytime it was supposed to show seven on the display, it showed eight instead. That's like, just a weird thing. Yeah, yeah, so I, it's along those lines. Nothing is actively wrong with the sound. The sound is working the way it should. It's doing it correctly. The right. info menu that is showing up is is incorrect. I don't know if that's, I doubt Marantz will ever fix it at this point. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a glitch. Yeah. Weird. There you go. Dan. Dan bought an LG C9 OLED and a Denon X3600H. He's trying to use them with his PS4 Pro. Unfortunately, he isn't getting a picture. Mm. His OLED turned on a setting called Ultra HD Deep Color, but with that on, his PS4 Pro wouldn't show any image. So he turned it off, and the picture from his PS4 Pro showed up. And then this Denon popped up a warning, which basically said, your TV is not configured to support am i supposed to read this well oh yeah it, i guess sure. i'm supposed to read this it says uh your your tv is not configured to support 4k 60p uh 4k 60p 444 422 or 4k 60p 420 10 bit video are you sure you want to use 4k enhanced so everything seems to indicate that his denon should be set to enhanced 4k signal output and his lg should have uh, ultra hd deep color turned on but he's getting no image from his ps4 pro if he does that so are there settings in his ps4 pro that he needs to change i'm gonna take a guess okay before you tell us the answer rob i think it's the cable that's my guess too yeah okay yeah yeah that is that is my guess um so yes the ultra hd deep color setting definitely in your lg needs to be turned on for whatever input you're using it needs to be turned on um the enhanced 4k signal format setting in the denon needs to be turned on if you want 4k with hdr 10 bit or 12 bit color all the things that you're hoping to get out of your ps4 pro those things do have to be on. Now, yeah. if you connect your PS4 Pro, so you, what you could do is plug your PS4 Pro directly into a different HDMI input on your LG, just so you can see and check the settings. But your PS4 Pro, if you're wanting to output 4K and HDR and all that, uh, both of those things, uh, HDR and um, deep color on the PS4 Pro, uh, the only options are off or auto, and they should be on auto, of course, because they're right. not supposed to be off. They probably already are. And the most likely thing here is that... Now, it could be one of two cables because it could be the That's HDMI true. cable going from your PS4 Pro into your Denon or it could be the HDMI cable going from your Denon to your LG. Either of those cables, if they are not a premium certified high-speed HDMI cable, might not have sufficient bandwidth to do this because the PS4 Pro on its menu, it is outputting the highest possible bit rate. It's doing 12-bit color RGB, which is the same as 444, uh, at right. 60 frames a second. It is maxing out those 18 gigabits per second, and when the cable doesn't handle it, you get blackness. And I really well, think is, that's what's going on. Uh, yeah, th this is what uh, cracks me up about people who are like, you know, oh, you know, I think I might be having an issue with my cable. My issue with my I'm like, you don't think mm. you have an issue with your HDMI cable. You either, I can't see anything, right. <laughs> or it's the, the the only possible like I might be having an issue is super duper weird sparkles everywhere yeah. and you would notice it it's not subtle or like a HDMI cable failings like a subtle. infrequent once in a while the image just kind of flicks on and off or like goes to fuzz for a moment and comes back that means you're right on the edge you're on the razor yeah. edge of having enough bandwidth but not quite but it's it, no it's not like yeah the color got slightly more you know vivid or no nothing like that it's like nothing like glitch that. or off or perfect yeah. <laughs> those are your options yeah. Uh, but no, the, yeah, your settings are correct. Uh, the, the settings in the PS4 Pro are not complicated. It's simply that they're auto instead of off. And if you're not seeing an image, it's it's almost certainly one of your two cables or both of your HDMI cables, possibly. Darren on Facebook. Darren has Clips reference Premiere speakers up front. And to round out his 5.1.4 setup, you got a pair of in-wall Clips RP speakers and two pairs of in-ceilings. But his ceilings uh, are such that he cannot actually install the in-ceilings clip speakers as normal. Instead, he's making angled boxes for them at the tops of his front and back walls. So they basically look like elevation speakers. How should he aim them? Should they be angled to point straight at his seats? Or should they be angled such that they're aimed somewhat above his head so they sort of fill the space overhead? Well, what's as close to firing straight down as humanly possible? Because mm. that's what you kind of want. <laughs> Although, if it's so, on your actual front wall and back wall, I wouldn't have them firing 
straight yeah, down yeah, yeah, yeah. when they're that far forward and that far back. I would just have them like going straight forward, you know, and then angled towards the couch, not angled in or out. Just mm. if they're on the front wall and back wall, right. just you know, angled down towards right. the so couch. Right, not, not towed in in any way, not no. angled inward. Not the azimuth doesn't change, but the ele- the, the the vertical, the the tilt, vertical, whatever that is. The yeah, tilt. So I don't remember. Yes, yeah. um, so. but tilted so that they're like more or less coming right down at the seat or firing a little bit overhead. What are we thinking yeah. there? Um, oh, uh, wherever your ears are, I guess. I mean, I would uh, t- t- towards the. I mean. I don't think it matters. Yeah, not really. <laughs> not a tremendous amount. I, I mean, I, I really think this is like eyeball. I mean, I, pro- <laughs> I probably wouldn't have them like literally firing straight forward, like straight right forward, along right. your ceiling. I probably wouldn't do that. I If I'm having front heights and rear heights, I am going to angle them down well, honestly, a little if, bit. If you're still within like that 15 degree yeah, cone see, within the cone. dead center, yeah. you'd still be okay. So yeah. just angle them down a little bit. You'll be fine. <laughs> I mean, if they were aimed... 30 degrees, if, how about that? 45, I don't mm, care. That probably, that's probably too much. That's probably hitting your feet at that point. Uh, no, I mean, uh, yeah, as long as you're within the cone of dispersion, I mean, just any speaker, if you're 15 degrees above or below straight, uh, straight forward, you are definitely within the cone of dispersion for... Right. Well, I don't know. I guess there could be some weird speaker, but... Normal speakers like this, you're definitely within that cone. I don't. I mean, yeah. if you get the angled ones like Prime Elevations or like Klipsch's angled ones that you can mount up on the walls, that, that's a 20 degree angle. That's what they use. Aim them at your chest. Aim <laughs> aim them directly at your chest. <laughs> your ears will be within that, and if you recline, you'll still be within that. Okay. That's We're saying just be within the cone, and you're good. Abhu on Twitter. Abhu is thinking he'll get an Xbox Series X, or as we like to call it, the X Sex. <laughs> That is what Microsoft always wanted when they called it the Xbox. We've gone from the X bone to the X sex. That's right. I can't, I can't make this stuff up. They did. Somebody over there. Is, they know. I they can't know wait. What I can't doing. wait to see how poorly they're going to handle audio with this new box <laughs> yep. of theirs. I'm very excited to see what ridiculousness we have to go through Two to try to PCM, get sides maybe. around. <laughs> <laughs> right now, your best bet to get. Full Atmos on everything is to output two channel PCM and let your receiver <laughs> do everything. Mm. Uh, so he's going to get one of the X sexes, and he'd like to get a TV and an AV receiver that can take full advantage. So that means HDMI 2.1, right? Are there any affordable TVs like TCLs that have that? And will a Marantz SR6014 uh, pass through all the HDMI 2.1 fig- uh, features? No, and no. 14? I don't think so. Not with the fourteen. No, no, there are That's there are no right? full bandwidth HDMI two point one receivers that you can buy right this minute. And what are we March third, twenty twenty? That we're recording this for people in the future. There are no AV receivers that you can buy right now that have full bandwidth HDMI two point one ports on them. Now there is confusion out there because unfortunately some people talk about quote unquote HDMI 2.1 features such as variable refresh rate or auto low latency mode, which are things that are found within the HDMI 2.1 specification. But without the full 48 gigabits per second bandwidth, you will not be able to have 4K resolution at 120 frames per second or 8K resolution. Those things require the full 48 gigabits per second bandwidth. No AV receiver on the market today can pass that through. Now, Yamaha already announced that they have models coming out later in 2020 that will have full bandwidth HDMI 2.1 ports on them. Denon and Marantz haven't announced it yet, but I am certain those are on the way sometime in 2020. So on the AV receiver side, wait, because all indications are that the Xbox Series X and the PlayStation 5 will be able to do 4K resolution at 120 frames per second or 8K resolution. All indications are that they're hoping to be able to do that. As far as affordable TVs with the full bandwidth, nope, there are TVs today with full bandwidth, 48 gigabits per second, HDMI 2.1. Those are the LG OLEDs that end in a nine, So the B9 and the C9 and so forth, full bandwidth. And Samsung's 8K televisions that came out in 2019 or newer. The ones that came out in 2018 never got full bandwidth HDMI 2.1. You can't even input 8K into them. And they're being marketed as 8K TVs. But that's Mm. it. So wait, Abu. That's what you got to do. Nick, 
Nick decided to follow our advice. Good. We're done. <laughs> oh, wait. Uh, there's a lot of mm -hmm. more question here. After after following our advice, he still has questions. I feel like we did something wrong. <laughs> Maybe our advice was not very good, Rob. It's, it's, I'll, I'll, I'll take the blame. That's on right. This one. This, you said it first on this one. Nick decided to follow our advice, and rather than getting a projector and three different motorized screens, he, he's just getting a 77-inch OLED. Ha! That was my advice. It was. You remember good, that. Good job, me. <laughs> Why are you still asking questions? Okay, back when Lee was first looking to get an OLED, Rob recommended buying uh, from a retailer, whether a return or exchange would be easy. This was because of the dark gray vertical banding, and Rob said it seemed like around 20% of OLED TVs had noticeable banding, so just keep exchanging until you get a good one. Is that still the case, or would it be okay to buy from a place like Newegg or Amazon Marketplace to get a lower price these days? I felt like we talked about that last week and said something about how the banding is much better these days. It, it certainly right? seems to be. I mean, it is anecdotal evidence. I'm going by like the number of people who are still complaining about it on forums and things like that. But anecdotally anyway, it seems as though the vertical banding issue now, it still exists. If you put up a full gray screen at you know 10% gray, the entire screen gray, and you walk yourself up to be within one foot of it, and you move your eyes across, and you completely black out your room, you're like, oh, there's a vertical band. They're not completely eliminated. And this is the case. But by and large, it seems like they have drastically improved on that front. Back when Lee was first shopping, that was during the 7 era. That was 2017. Yeah. Uh, and, and at that time, they definitely had more vertical bending. It seems like a lot of that has been sorted. And the C9, which is the one that he's going for, I feel quite comfortable. And also, like, Newegg isn't bad. They'll take a return if there's something wrong, an exchange if there's actually something wrong with the television. So I, I feel mm -hmm. quite comfortable going that way. So which Ultra HD Blu-ray player should he get? The wire cutter is still recommending the Sony players, but they do warn about the weird having to manually turn Dolby Vision on and off thing, so they suggest <laughs> the $500 Panasonic. UB820 as the upgrade pick. Are those really his best options? Seems strange that there isn't an inexpensive player that could just output what's on the disc without anything fancy. Uh, yeah, would that there were. Yeah, would that there were. were. Yeah, I mean, this is sort of the. I hate to say it, but we're. It's just this is still. A, not only is this uh, technology still relatively new compared to uh, other things, it's also super not popular. Yeah, so, I mean, no, know. nobody, <laughs> not a single company at CES announced a new Ultra HD Blu-ray player. It's just. Yeah. I, I think it's possible that what we have on the market right now is as far as the players will go. Now, there is a player out there that is what we want, and that is Panasonic's UB450, but they don't sell it in North America. <laughs> Which, hmm. I mean, I don't know. Maybe it seems inconvenient. <laughs> maybe it'll come here eventually. I mean, the UB450, what it does is it will output all of the HDR formats, HDR10+, plus, Dolby Vision, regular HDR10, HLG even. It will output all of the HDR formats. It does not have Panasonic's HDR optimizer, but it's only the equivalent of about $250 in Europe and Asia where it is available. Right. Um, but yeah, in North America, uh, you, we've got the UB420, which does not have Dolby Vision. So if that's the thing you were looking for, doesn't give it to you. Or the $500 UB820, which does all the things and does them very well and has the HDR optimizer. So it's got to step over the 450 in that regard. Right. But the price is twice as much. It's crazy that this is where we are with Ultra HD Blu-ray pairs, but unfortunately, that is the situation. So it's either import a UB450, which probably means you need a power adapter, because it's either going to be a European plug or... Um, I guess there's some plugs in what Asia. About, what about uh, localization of discs? So or Ultra, Ultra HD, HD, HD Blu-rays have no regions. So right, you'd be okay. fine as far as Ultra HD Blu-rays, but for regular Blu-rays and DVDs, those still have regions, and you'd, well, there, well, you, yeah, you'd, you'd have issues that there. So it would only be good for playing Ultra HD Blu-rays, which seems like a, a weird compromise to make. So I kind of got to say you pony up for the UB820, because that's the one that does all the things. Hmm. Well, if it makes you feel any better, when we were looking for universal disc players back when, uh, before Blu-ray, I think? Oh, sure. I think they were like three thousand dollars from Denon, <laughs> <laughs> and that gave you DVD, DVD audio, uh, and SACD, SACD. Yeah. yeah, and DVDA, and that, and then, yeah, that's what it gave you. And then Opal came out with a five hundred dollar one, and we all lost our minds. Mm -hmm. So five hundred dollars seems, and that was like ten years ago. <laughs> yeah. So that seemed really reasonable back then. So maybe, maybe it's not as bad as we think it is. So, anyways, he's in a wide open space, and he's dealing with about ten thousand bajillion 
cubic feet of air. He's using the Outlaw Audio LFM1 subwoofer that's placed in the corner about 12 feet from his primary seat. And if you're wondering, that sub is, while a great sub, wildly inadequate for this space. <laughs> it's not even close. So he and he knows this. This is not this is not news to him. So he he just got a Denon X thirty six hundred H, and so this is his first time using Odyssey Multi QXC thirty two. Before it began, uh, it got him to adjust the volume knob on this Outlaw a subwoofer uh, to get the green light. He had to max out the volume knob. Mm-hmm. That's always a fun feeling. <laughs> but it did get there. That's one thing. That is something, yeah. So after as Odyssey had run, it, it, it set the subwoofer output uh, trim level to minus five. So that means it was lowering the subwoofer out, uh, output level, correct? Yep. That's, that, that's, that's what it does. That's exactly yeah. what it did. 5 dB down. Nick says he typically listens with the master volume about negative 20 uh, dB, I suppose is what mm-hmm. it is. But uh, but this is also his first time using Odyssey a Dynamic EQ, and he is greatly enjoying those results. He feels like his subwoofer and surround speakers have, quote, come to life, mm-hmm. end quote. But his Outlaw LFM1 dial vol- volume dial is still up at maximum. <laughs> he doesn't want to risk breaking it. He isn't hearing any distressing sounds. In fact, it sounds great. But should he have any concern? And since the subwoofer trim level ended up at minus 5, could he actually lower his subwoofer's volume dial? Would that provide a bit uh, of extra safety? I mean, I, in the end, it would end up being the same. You would either lower the volume dial, and then you would raise the tr- the, the trim level would end up being re- uh, increased. It would be um, increased, but perhaps just to zero or plus two yeah. or three or something like that. Um, I mean, really, what you're what you're I'd be most worried about is accidental you know super loud volume. Mm. You know, like you know, you were watching one thing and or doing. Doing like I was doing today or the other day when I set up these speakers, which, you know, I, I turned on the manual test tones. I had to put my volume up to zero right. to get the full reference volume out of the stupid test tones, not full reference, but 75 dB. And uh, and then I went to go watch something mm. else and I didn't turn it down. Remember that I had done that. And, the, you know, the Xbox turned on. I was like, Bleh! Yes. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> hello. Good morning, kids. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Daddy, um... Daddy wasn't. Daddy didn't have his coffee yet. You want to give him a break here? Yeah, so, I mean the Outlaw LFM uh, one. It's a bash amplifier. They are yeah. they are pretty darn solid. Um, the chances of you actually damaging the sub are low, but not impossible. Not, non-existent. Um, yeah. yeah. I I would personally be more comfortable if my volume dial weren't at literal maximum on a, right. on a sub with a bash amplifier. I, I mean it's it's tough to say because if if everything in the signal is the way it should be. It should be okay. It's right. if there's a signal that goes above reference, which is possible to do because you, you can turn the master volume dial above zero dB, or, you or could, something that just mixed really super hot. Something that's and you're mixed not, super. I mean, that could be know. like YouTube for sure. Um, exactly. YouTube is so loud. Yeah. Else. So I mean, I feel most comfortable keeping a subwoofer's volume dial that that you know one that isn't DSP protected on an SVS sub on a mono price sub. I'm like, go ahead and turn it to maximum. I don't care. You're never gonna break the thing. Um, but but on most subs, I'd like to keep it at like 75 percent or lower. To me, that like feels quite safe. There's more gain inside of that amplifier to be had. How, how, do, how do you feel about a subwoofer upgrade? Well, and how there's and that. how do you feel about uh? Maybe not forcing it, maybe not going out and buying one now, but just leaving the sub volume where it is and just knowing someday <laughs> you'll, you may have to upgrade your sub whether you like it or not. Or a, or a <laughs> you'll pop, hear a clang. Uh, something, <laughs> yeah. something real nasty. I don't know about that. You're yeah. not going to get any money selling it off at that point. Um, well, you can see, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. That, anyway, that's my. I I, I'd feel most comfortable. I, I'd turn it down to like 75%, run Odyssey again, see what it does. If it goes and puts can you, you a- move it closer to you can you just physically move it closer it to you i mean it's not gonna make a subwoofer a, though it's not gonna do it yeah it's not gonna do a ton but at least it you would feel it more like, yeah. you would have you know, that sort of 60 to 80 sensation. hertz range and above that it's doing more but hmm. that's my advice anyway I, i'm not super comfortable having it literally maxed out with a bash amplifier although they are pretty well protected and as long as the signal is within the range that it's supposed to be it will be okay so yeah I don't think we helped. So if he sets it down to 75, it's just going to be really quiet, though. I mean, if he sets it down to 75, it, it, a plus 12 dB on that thing is not, or whatever, I think it's plus 12 is the max it mm-hmm. can go. It's probably not going to bring it back up to where Yeah, and don't leave it at plus 12. Don't, don't do that. You see, that's what I'm saying. I know. You know you're, you're just going to end up with it's a quiet, quiet sub, which you don't want. 
This is life. Mm. You got 10,000 cubic feet. Sub can only do what it can do. Go the power sound audio. Yeah. Just browse around. That's right. Just look around. Or hey, might be might, might be something there for HSU. you. HSU, HSU are the people who designed your uh, LFM one. That VTF fifteen H is sitting right there for nine hundred bucks. Nine hundred dollars, dude. You could play like a Russian roulette with your subwoofer, and you know, in your savings, you could save up. <laughs> <laughs> See if you could get to nine hundred dollars before you break the sub. If you get to nine hundred dollars <laughs> before you break the sub, there you go. Then you sell the sub, and then whatever that is, you use that to take it's your wife race. to dinner to say, "I'm sorry for." <laughs> Spending nine hundred dollars on a new sub, I didn't need this. One. I didn't honestly need. Jay, Jay just thought it would be fun to get our thoughts on the new fifty-inch. Oh, speaking of subs that you might want to mm. buy, on the new fifty-inch seismic monitor subwoofer SMG SMS G fifty seismic monitor subwoofer. A word in German G. that means sealed. <laughs> that starts with the letter oh. G. I don't know how to pronounce it. All right, it's made by Ascendo. Ascendo was uh, also Moonlights as a low rent superhero and bouncer at a bar uh in germany and pro uh, profiled by sound and vision recently the creator talks about how the design really began with the enclosure which is six feet tall because they wanted <laughs> a sealed box with the resonant frequency below 20 hertz mm -hmm. now this is a 50 inch driver 50 that's right. inches 50 inches that's uh, to, uh, to, uh the biggest driver you've ever mm -hmm. seen it's literally nearly the size of the stupid one that's at the beginning of uh, uh, Back to the Future. Right. If you think of Back to the Future, think two-thirds of that, maybe three-quarters of that <laughs> driver is what this thing looks like. Okay? It's ridiculous. Uh, six foot tall because they want to sell a box with a resonant frequency below 20 hertz, but when, then when they tested every available subwoofer driver, even using multiple drivers, none could meet their output and group delay goals and... Uh, could justify how much they're going to charge you mm -hmm. for it. So they made their own 50-inch driver out of carbon fiber composite. It had to be manufactured in sections, and they ma uh, ma mated that to a 14-inch diameter voice co coil with 88 pounds of neodymium magnets because rare earth metals... Eh. <laughs> Don't worry about the people that are mining those things. Uh -huh. eh, it's fine. It'll be fine first world problems uh the end result can output uh, 140 decibels at 20 hertz and 105 decibels down at five hertz not that you can hear it but you will certainly feel it <laughs> uh all with very low group delay at the time of the article they said they've sold eight of them all to private home theaters and places like dubai and china and indonesia i believe mm -hmm. uh no commercial cinemas have ordered as yet any comments uh it's ridiculous and stupid and <laughs> whatever but and I mean, it's it's like a five foot tall enclosure or six foot tall enclosure. The, now, if, when you go to their website, and I have no idea how much the rest of their subwoofers cost, but th they're all they're not called subwoofers; they're called super or sub sub super sub subwoofer. I don't know. They're called subliminal or something like that. They're not called. They're like meant to be the very very lowest, and then some of their subwoofers don't even reach eighty hertz. Mm. Many of them top out of uh, at a hundred. Right. So there's not a lot of headroom above 80 hertz mm -hmm. that, that you're seeing here. So this is these are subs that are meant to go super duper low. Yeah. Uh, now, I have no idea what these things sound like or how linear they are or anything else. But what I do like about them is that they're tall and thin. And they're almost, <laughs> well, they almost look like they're... <laughs> they appear I mean, tall and thin, thin because of how ridiculously tall they are. I mean, it's still like, what is that, about two and a half feet deep? <laughs> <laughs> right, but I'm talking about their other subs. They have oh, a whole okay. bunch of other subs that they offer okay. that are, you know, 36 inch drivers and 24 inch drivers, yeah. which are still stupidly it large. Is. But they're they're, you know, they're reasonable size, and but they <laughs> tend to be much thinner than you would expect. And even this this thing, which is humongous, yes. but it literally, I think the voice, the back of the voice coil is on the back wall of this thing. I mean, yeah, it's, pretty it's, close. It, it is a, absolutely as shallow as it possibly can be. So while I believe that this thing is ridiculous and. I, I mean, I don't think there's much call, cause for it. I mean, I think it weighs over 200 kilograms of that. If I'm I right, think so. If yeah. I'm right. Well, I mean, it's 88 pounds so, of magnet. The driver is like 160 pounds. So yeah, right there. And that's not even including the cabinet, which is monstrous. Um, yeah. So it, it's, but it's enormous. I, I don't mind, uh, you know, some of their other offerings. And yeah. I wouldn't mind taking a listen to them or, you know, getting an idea of what they 
you know how they actually perform in in measure because you know relatively speaking i like this idea i like the idea of a driver of a of a subwoofer that is thinner mm. than you know and taller because i'd rather have something that i mean there's so many times where like well you put a couple in the corners people are like, i don't got enough room in the corner well if you had something that was three and a half feet wide and five feet tall but only you know five inches thick <laughs> You put it you along put a wall it somewhere. Along a wall, right in the front left corner, in the back right corner, and you know it's a subwoofer, so you just give it enough. And they most of them have front uh, slots or front ports of right. some sort, and you know it, it just makes it super easy to put these things uh, pretty much wherever you want to put them. And I like that. Okay. So I'm not. A, I mean, clearly this thing is a publicity stunt yes. meant for the ultra rich. That if you have to ask how much it costs. Uh, I like that he said that it's going to cost uh, hundreds to thousands of dollars to install. I'm like, that seems real that seems low real to me. low ball. I, yes, definitely. I think maybe that's a bad translation for German. A... What he meant was hundreds to thousands, you know, hundreds of thousands to right. millions is what he <laughs> yeah. meant to say, <laughs> you know, or something like that. Maybe maybe that's but, just the uh, way they speak. No, I, considering it requires a crane to move it. Um, yeah. yeah. I'm I'm thinking that's more than just a few hundred dollars worth of installation costs alone. Never One mind how much the thing costs. But yeah, objectively for their design goals, I mean they're not wrong. Physics is physics. If you want a sealed yeah, yeah. cabinet that has a resonant frequency below 20 hertz, yeah, it's gotta be that size. That's just how it works. But nothing, of course, of course, nothing is said about the research that has been done into our ability to hear group delay. I mean, group delay is just how long does it take from when the signal was sent to when the sound producing device actually gets to the volume level that the signal was requesting. And in the case of subwoofers that have ports, um, there's some amount of time because it, re it relies on the resonance of the port to get you to the output level that the signal right. requested. So there is that delay in there. Whereas a seal driver is essentially just relying on the movement of the woofer itself and so it's shorter group delay but to get to that volume output you need to move a massive amount of air right now so right again they're not wrong about that but our ability to detect group delay as frequency goes down gets worse and worse and worse like everywhere below about 40 hertz it gets real tough for us to detect group delay because the wave is already so long. The room is shorter right. than the wavelength. We're always hearing... Not for people buying these things. Yes. We're always <laughs> hearing reflected sound at that point, at least in our homes. And so mm -hmm. whether the sub is using some group delay to get to that maximum volume level doesn't really matter that much. So it's kind of chasing after something you don't need. But well, this is the the essence of esoteric there. gear, though. Yes. This is the essence of esoteric gear. It's like, oh, I'm going to make cables that have the lowest possible resistance. Yeah, fantastic. You know, er everything else about this cable is bad, but its <laughs> resistance, its resistance is phenomenal. You know, it acts like a it acts like a, an EQ on my signal, but the resistance <laughs> is phenomenal. I'm like, yeah, this is a this is certainly, you know, the, the the sales pitch is a straw man. It's like, oh, we were trying to get the, the best group delay that mm -hmm. we possibly get. And every, no one that says, but but why? Yeah. Because if, everybody if, sits around and goes, okay, well, I mean, that must be something important. If you set really, up your really parameters and you say yeah. this is the only way to get there, I mean, they're not lying about that, but it's are the yeah. parameters... Do the parameters need to be set the way they set them <laughs> to get good performance? Yeah. And in this case, the answer is no. So... This Sorry. is just meant to to sell the. I mean, if, if uh, this is like anything else, it's it, you're not meant to sell. Obviously, these not. in bulk. Who is buying you know, these? Very few people. Yeah, very few people. But what it is getting you to do is go to their website yeah. and figure out what else they have for all the things and that honestly, you actually could consider buying for real. Right. Yeah. And uh, I, I would be interested in hearing more about some of those other subwoofers right. because, especially for all you guys who have your uh, your false walls and mm -hmm. you know weird things that aren't closets but certainly look like closets but don't have doors you know there th this is that they have the kind of offerings where you could just slide them back there and it would just go perfectly you know but i mean i mean where do you get this stuff from you gotta <laughs> go to a specialty dealer and it probably costs a bajillion dollars so sorry we'll still we'll continue to recommend sbs 
Rob, this different Rob, not this Rob, different Rob. Rob previously asked us about his Dayton SA-1000 amplifier and how much power it is drawing while it is in standby. He was expecting it to be like his Denon X4400H and his SVS subwoofer, both of which draw less than one watt when they're in standby. But it appears that we were correct in the Dayton, and by we, he means Rob, was correct in that the Dayton amp will always draw about 20 watts even when it's asleep. He wanted to be able to cut that constant power draw, so he bought a four-pack of heavy-duty smart plugs that work with Amazon's voice assistant. Uh, these smart plugs also monitor power draw, and he found it interesting to discover that his Xbox One X is by far his most power-hungry device. It, too, is drawing a constant 20 watts when it's asleep and a continuous 350 watts or so when it's in use. Thank you, video it's driver. It's a PC, yes. By contrast, even when powering his full surround sound system, his den receiver never seems to draw more than 130. <laughs> yes, for everyone worrying about I need uh, 200 watts times 11 uh, yeah, yeah that, that's how much power is actually being drawn by speakers most of the time. Less than that. In any case, he can now use his app, an app or a voice command to cut the power to his Dayton amp completely, and it has a hard power switch, so turning the power back on is just as easy. But when he cuts the power at the outlet like this, his Dayton makes a pretty loud curr thunk sound. If he presses, if he presses Dayton's power button, it seems to softly power down. So softly, it seems to softly power down. <laughs> I wonder, I wonder why. So is he potentially damaging the amp or the bass shakers that he has it attached to? That's this is pretty much the same as yanking the power cord when it's on or having a sudden blackout correct uh yeah so yeah. Yeah, most amps have a soft uh a soft power down mode and so a that soft you don't get that as well start yeah. as well right so you can get that you don't get that big pop yeah it's a uh, sudden rush of current that happens otherwise is this gonna hurt your bass shakers i mean i don't really like bass shakers that much anyway <laughs> so i don't care but <laughs> i mean uh, bass shakers i'm to... really not worried about uh, no, no, that, no, yeah. yeah. I, I, that that I'm not worried about at all. But the amplifier is it anything happening there? I wouldn't think so. I, don't think so. I mean, I mean, it, it's just they put these things in here because the uh, people are worried about their speakers, basically. Yeah. And now we, you know, it's just it's common practice to put these, you know, the soft start and the stop, soft uh, stop. Uh, so that you don't get these weird noises. Uh, I, I, I would be worried about it if it were, there was a full range, not a full range, but, you know, a regular speaker attached right. to it with with a tweeter. Yeah. I would yeah. be worried about a tweeter yeah. being broken. I'm not worried about a bass shaker nope. or, an or a subwoofer or anything like that. Nah. Agreed. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. you, you it, this is very much just like yanking the power cord out or having a blackout. And you wouldn't expect your amplifier to die because you had a blackout. I mean, you'd go, hey, what the heck happened? I mean, maybe when the power comes back on, <laughs> there's a right. if there's a surge, big rush. But, um, yeah. but not because the power went out. You wouldn't expect your amplifier to get hurt by that. So, yeah, it's a little bit of a scary sound, but I, I think you're okay. Mike. Mike has noticed that when he plays Netflix, Hulu, Disney Plus, or Apple TV Plus on his Apple TV 4K, the audio is quieter and the bass sounds weaker than when he plays it the same service on his Android box. Which one is correct? Things sound more immediately impressive coming out of his Android streaming box, but if he just turns up his master volume knob when using his Apple TV 4K, things do sound more pronounced. He has to get close to 0 dB on his volume dial, though, so does the Apple TV 4K have lower audio quality? No, it definitely has lower base volume i mean like whatever the standard volume of this thing is <laughs> is lower uh i mean you think of that just it's just the gain issue is all it this is, is just gain and, and the apple tv yeah. 4k i mean in my experience with my system it is correct uh in that yeah. if i switch between say my oppo ultra hd blu-ray player and my apple tv 4k i don't have to change the volume those two things right. are outputting movies at the same volume, which to me is, well, they're putting it out at proper reference level volume and everything gets calibrated correctly. If your Android streaming box, and I don't know which one he has, I don't think it's the NVIDIA Shield because my NVIDIA Shield, I also don't have to adjust the volume unless it's in the source like YouTube or something like that. But Netflix right, right, right. to Netflix or Plex to Plex, I don't have to change the volume between my NVIDIA Shield and my Apple TV 4K. So I think he's got a different streaming box that is running Android TV. There's lots of them out there. The chances that one of those other boxes maybe has a higher gain setting on its output seems very possible. Yeah. Um, but and yeah. I, I wouldn't say that. I mean, I, I think in general, which one's more correct? I think Rob's right that the Apple TV is probably the more correct one. But the reality is it's just the... Chain, if you level match the two boxes right. and switch to AB between yeah. them, you would not be able to now, tell the difference. Now, there is a setting in the Apple TV 4K 
uh, in the audio settings. And it's right on the front page. You don't have to go digging for it. Like, not the front page, but if you go into the, you know, the display and sound settings part of the Apple right. TV 4K's menu, it's right there that does say, uh, ugh, what are the exact words they use? It's something along the lines of, like, um, lower uh, loud noises or something like it. It's, it basically, it's a dynamic range f control. Compressor. Uh, yeah, and yeah. by default, that is on. Now, I suspect he would have seen that, but maybe not. I mean, it, it, by default, it is on. So go into the sound and display settings, and there is the little uh, setting there that uh, for dynamic range compression. It's something about make sounds quiet, make loud sounds quieter, I think is what it says. So turn that off, because that... that could potentially be part of this. Uh, but otherwise, it's more likely that your Android stream box is actually louder than reference would be, other reference devices would be. And that is what the individual uh, input level setting on your AV receiver is for. Your AV receiver likely has uh, input by input the ability to raise right. or lower the volume of that one input. And you might actually want to lower the volume level of your Android box because it's the one that's in all likelihood actually too loud. Okay, his room is open at the back to his kitchen and dining area. The ceiling is slightly sloped with the low end at the front of the room where his projection screen is. His floor is hard. Uh, so his soft couch uh, and love seat plus a rug in front of his couch are about the only absorptive things in this open uh, concept room. Have you considered getting a large cat? We understand <laughs> yeah, that's those right. are quite absorptive. <laughs> yeah. So for those, if you're not on YouTube, he's it's a normal looking space. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's not floors. it's not enormous. We're not talking about a, yeah. a huge wide space, but it's open concept where we can see there's an opening at the back that he's, leads to his kitchen. He's sitting, you know, probably ten feet away yeah. from a uh, well, like a hundred inch screen. Kind of looks like maybe. Uh, yeah, he's got it. clip speakers all up. Front, yeah, so you got no problem with output seat. of those speakers to your seating position. We know That's that. Sure got towers man yeah, those and the big center so he's got about four hundred dollars to put towards acoustic panels right now should he go with gick or acoustamac and where should he place them as for subwoofers he has two hsu subs but they're in the front two corners and won't be moved uh okay yeah, well, I'm such as life it sounds like they're very obstinate speak uh subwoofers and you should have a stern <laughs> talking with them don't tell me you won't be moved sir i'm the boss of this place uh yeah so uh i would go with the cheapest which in this case would be acoustamac <laughs> acoustamac is a little less yeah. expensive now what i like about gix normal panels is they build their frames such that there is an air gap behind the absorption of their standard panels like their 242 or their 244 yeah. panels uh the frames are deeper than the insulation itself so there's an air gap automatically built in acoustamac doesn't do that acoustamac the panel is just the insula insulation that's the depth of the panel uh, Gick has very similar ones that they call their spot panels. They used to only offer their spot panels in one inch thickness. Now they offer them in a two inch thickness. So a two inch thick Gick spot panel is about the same as a regular Acoustamac two inch panel. Those things will mm. perform very similarly and they're actually priced kind of similarly. But Acoustamac has more finish options without the price going up drastically so if you want something other than just plain fabric if you want suede or something with a pattern on it acoustamac can give you that without the price going up much uh so i think acoustamac is probably a little bit you know bang for buck you get a little bit more panel or a, a finish option at a lower price and i have no problem with their performance but don't go for the one inch go for at least two inch panels so he's got nothing on these walls, just nothing. about. It looks like there's something behind him. Might be some pictures. It's hard to really yeah, see. Yeah, but those are definitely not projector. panels of any kind. Those They're are definitely hanging not pictures, if they're anything. So the, the mm -hmm. places I would bo I would first focus on it are the uh, wherever the uh, the re first reflection points are of your main, on your uh, side your walls, front, front left, yeah. yeah, your front left of speakers. I would put a lot behind your head because those speakers are firing right directly at your face, and there is a wall behind yeah. you. So I would put something back there to catch any reflections. Yeah, so uh, right below where his projector is hanging, uh, basically yeah. where his picture frames are right now. I'd like to have a panel there. Uh, thicker the better, to be honestly, but at least yeah. a two-inch panel, maybe a four-inch if you can afford it. And I'd put like a couple of two-foot by four-foot panels on each sidewall, your left and right sidewalls. Mm -hmm. Yep. Start with that. I, that. That's probably his $400 budget right there, but just about. I yeah. would love to have some base traps in those front left and right corners, but yep. um, it's more important to have the back wall and the side walls first. You'll probably notice that a bit more. Right. So uh, corner traps would be great yeah. where, if you can get them. And then, you know, we're talking in the future here, yeah. you know, behind your front speakers, behind your center channel, those would all be 
other places that you would mm-hmm. you know, basically anywhere yeah kind of kind of but <laughs> we haven't even touched the ceiling yet but you know there's a fan up there so probably not uh so he says he's using an epson 2150 projector he, he does most of his viewing during the day he keeps his lights off and he has blinds over his two windows at the back and curtains over the windows that are behind the screen there's a small there, there's a small narrow and tall uncovered window in the door that's to the left of his screen so it's dim when he's watching but certainly not pitch black should he consider an ambient light rejecting screen i would consider buying an direct view tv before i would consider a light rejecting <laughs> screen but i hate those things so i mean i mean you can consider it but i wouldn't buy it um, so there you go yeah, i mean tom that's tom my, and i do thought. disagree on this and that i am willing to consider ambient light rejecting screens but only the really good ones and they are not cheap uh you yeah. know the one that i'm willing to consider is a loon visions it does work i mean black is still not true black but it it is darker and the contrast stays there and it doesn't look bad when when it is pitch black at night. Um, you know you don't get the horrible hot spotting that most screens that call themselves ambient light rejecting. Um, that's the thing that Tom really hates about them is that the picture becomes uneven in the dark. It doesn't look as good as just a white screen. Um, yeah. But so I mean, Aluna Visions is my favorite, but it's not cheap. It is two thousand dollars plus. You know what's cheaper than that? Blackout curtains. Right. <laughs> Blackout yeah. curtains are way cheaper. I mean, than if, all if this. you're Even saying if I've they... got a tight budget of four hundred dollars for my acoustic treatments, I'm like, do you have two grand plus for your projection screen? I mean, that's it's way more than what you paid for your projector. So yeah. it kind of, kind of doesn't make a lot of sense, you know. I would move. I would buy a big OLED and then move my couch close enough right. to it so that. It I mean, I'm felt pretty like sure the... he was probably thinking maybe elite screens at the at the yeah. most i think he was probably thinking something like like a carl's place fabric or something like that you know they call it ambient light reject i'm like it it's not really it's it's basically gray with gain that's what it yeah. is and i don't consider that truly ambient light rejecting to me ambient light rejecting has to have like geometry in the screen with mm-hmm. like black on the top and a sawtooth design and reflection from the like that type of thing and that's not what those are they're just gray with gain and i'm like nah that's right. that's not a good choice right to do this right it co- does cost yeah. a lot of money and i doubt that if you're going to only spend 400 dollars on room yeah. treatments that you're going to want to spend I mean, and, at this and when point, you're, you might as well be considering the OLED. When your projector was a twenty one fifty, I'm like, I don't, I don't think this person is looking to spend twenty five hundred dollars on their screen. It doesn't Dude, make like, sense. Uh, the the blackout curtains at Amazon I just bought right. were like ridiculous, like sixteen twenty dollars, twenty five dollars right. a piece, and you two for a window. And if there's a door or whatever, I mean, get some PVC pipe. I hate to say this, I mean, but if you were going to do like on the budget, get if it's a door with a window yeah, in a it that you, you can't do it, just build like a frame of the PVC and you know you know glue it together and then slide it into place well, actually he could, and in his the case the little window that he has he could take some like packing foam and just like put it in there when he's watching and pull it back up when he's done right yeah. something like that yeah anything Dwayne Dwayne asks which is the better tv the 82 inch samsung q60r or the 86 inch lg um 8070 both are 4k lcd tvs both say they do hdr but the lg says it does Dolby vision and the sun says it does hdr 10 plus is there a big picture as a big picture quality difference what are our thoughts i don't have any thoughts on this one. all right i'm gonna get some water i need water I'm sounds good i'll go ahead and answer if these were my only two options. I would go for the Samsung Q60 over the LG UM8070. I don't know how anybody is satisfied with an LG LCD. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sure there are people listening to this right now who have one and are like, I think it looks great. I I, I can't stand them. I'm sorry. The, uh, it's not just the IPS panels that don't have very good black levels in contrast. If you're in a really bright room all the time, you might not notice that. It's the unevenness of the lighting. Like I've never seen an LG and the larger they get, the worse this gets. I've never seen an LG LCD TV that has a nice even backlight other than like the one or two full array local dimming ones that they did at one point. Uh, But that isn't the case with this one. This is an edge lit uh, display. So the Samsung Q60R is an edge lit, but at least it's a VA panel. At least it looks fairly uniform. And if these were my only two options, I would go for the Samsung here. But I wouldn't get either of these. Uh, I would step up. (laughs) I mean, I know price is obviously what you're looking at here because you're going for the big size at the low cost. But I would go for the Q70 because the Q70 
in Samsung's lineup is such a step up from the Q60, it's kind of ridiculous. Um, the Q70 gives you full array local dimming, um, not a tremendous number of zones, but some better than one strip of light along the bottom, which is what the Q60 has. Uh, yeah. the, the contrast is so much higher. The um, ability to show you HDR, like the Q60, it tops out at like 350 nits. It's like, it's, it's really not HDR. Um, mm. So to me, I'm like, I wouldn't get either of these. A, a Q70, I can fully get behind. So that's my real answer, Dwayne. Unfor I know I'm asking you to spend more money, but like, it's so How much worth more it. is it? Uh, I think it's about five hundred dollars more ish, something in there. I'd have to look. That sounds it. like a lot. It, it kind of is, but I mean, it's like this is not a subtle difference we're talking about here. I would, I wouldn't tell it to you that way if it were. All right. Let's see, sent your hate mail to Rob at AV. Right That's now. right. <laughs> no one ever sends you hate mail. I get all the hate mail. <laughs> so, somewhat. So, has anybody ever sent you an angry email? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, we got that guy who's posted comments on uh, on the website who, who just, you know, really wants to stick it to me because I recommend the Apple TV 4K and he hates them. Oh, there's that guy. But there was the guy <laughs> that uh, bought the Sierra uh, speakers and didn't like oh, them. Oh, yeah, and we, that's right. You know, that, that guy probably sent you something mean, too. <laughs> so, two. <laughs> uh, everybody loves Rob. Ben. Ben is making his 12 foot wide by 16 foot long by 8 foot high enclosed room into a dedicated home theater. Since the room is not large, he would like to maximize the space. He's been strongly considering uh, the RBH signature on wall speakers for his front three and the RBH Ultra One on wall speakers for his surrounds. Other than the Kef T series, RBH Ultra One seem to be about the skinniest on wall speakers around. With the so, with the room only 12 feet wide, this is very appealing mm -hmm. to him. The Ultra One speakers are only rated down to 100 hertz in his current setup. He's using only a single subwoofer, and he's found that using a crossover higher than 80 hertz starts to make it look realizable. But in this new dedicated home, uh, new dedicated theater design, he'll have multiple subs. So will a higher crossover be okay? He's finding himself a bit hung up on the 80 hertz number. All right, so two things. First of all, how close is your current sub to you now when you can localize it? Because I have only ever been able to localize a sub when the, I am practically sitting on it, oh. which means it's right behind my couch or something along those lines. So uh, the further away it is from you, I believe, and in a closed space like this, the further away it is from you, the more likely it is going to be, in my opinion, in my experience, that you're not going to be able to localize it. But he's going to have multiple very... subs anyway, at which point so, I'm not worried at all. <laughs> right. So th this is from the single sub. Right. You know, like if you just took this one right. sub and stuck it in this, you know, put it in the corner that's furthest away from you, I doubt you're going to be able to localize it. I think the only localizing you'll be able to do, it'll be between your ears and won't be between you and the sub. It, you'll think you can localize it, but <laughs> if somebody snuck in there and switched the sub to the other corner, you would have no idea. Uh, having multiple subs will make this a non-issue. I actually think that the 100 hertz, uh, this is RBH we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Those people have no idea how to exaggerate. Yeah. At no, all. it's very accurate. They only they don't, they don't round. Yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, there. I would be very surprised if your receiver thought these were a hundred hertz uh, crossover. I wouldn't be surprised uh, if that's on, exactly where it sets them. <laughs> you think so? I, think, I, I wouldn't be. I'd yeah. be surprised if they. I wouldn't be surprised if they if it ended up sending them at eighty. Yeah. Uh, or at least ninety. In I any event, this is no concern whatsoever. I mean. Ideally, you could actually you would be actually be setting your subwoofers to play all the way up to the transition frequency of the room because by definition that is where it sound truly becomes localizable is above that frequency. But we do start running into other issues that happen if you were to set a 250 hertz crossover. Uh, there's there's right. not much doubt about that. But no, a 100 hertz crossover, a 120 hertz crossover, even getting up to 150 hertz when you've got multiple subs. Uh, it not going to be an issue. So don't worry. The Ultra Ones, I think, are a fantastic choice in this case. Yeah. The signature on wall speakers are just over four inches deep. Would it be okay to mount them and then basically cover the rest of the front wall with four inches of insulation? It would all be going behind a false wall and an acoustically transparent screen. I have no problems with it. A-OK. -okay. In I fact, you just made yourself good. a THX baffle wall. There Congratulations. That's uh, kind well, of Well, the one thing... You, to so it, to... to <laughs> To say what would I be uh, have problems with is if the insulation was proud or in front of sure. 
the the front of the speaker. Because then that's going to affect your I would, with dispersion of the sound at that yeah, point. Yeah, that that is where I would have the issue. As long as as long as the insulation, as long as the speaker is in front of the insulation, mm -hmm. I'm okay with yep. it. So yeah. He would like his theater, uh, a theater look in this room. So he's planning on a stage at the front of his room. Would it be better to just make a solid stage that is filled with sand, or should he leave openings and fill the stage with insulation to act, act as an acoustic uh, absorption? Uh, yeah, I'd fill it with sand. Me too. And then if there was space left over, you could put some absorption in there. But I just want I it inert. I just fill it with sand. Uh, the the yeah. stage at the front of the room, I just I just want it inert. I don't want to be messing around trying to turn that thing into a uncalculated base trap. Not forget that nonsense. Just make the thing inert, and you're done. Mm-hmm. All right, I'm trying. I'm just looking at the pronunciation. Thank you. First of all, thank you for the pronunciation. I don't know if it came from him or for you, but either way, but thank you. I'm just gonna make sure. Uh, Davide, 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 who says "ciao" from Italy. So our Italian. It is an Italian friend here. Yeah, and this is a freaking house, is what this is. Yep. Jeez, here we go. I'm an dude. <laughs> I. Jay. This is gonna be very hard to explain to you guys. Mm. So I would highly recommend you go to avrant.com and click on the pictures. And scroll down to number 14. I don't know how Rob does this, but it's the white with the wood on the ceiling. Because this place <laughs> is like my dream home. So, Davide, I'm coming to visit. I don't know where he lives. In, <laughs> in Italy. Italy. But I've been to Italy. I love it. So, Davide, oh, it's in Tuscany. Davide is renovating a 14th century villa in Tuscany. The large attic will include an open area where he'd like to install a theater with all the openings and sloping uneven shape of the ceiling. This thing is like, I mean, it's a castle yeah so no straight lines on the ceiling uh, with all the openings in the sloping uneven shape of the ceiling with exposed wooden, be wooden beams the total space is roughly 1100 square feet with an average height of around 15 feet so it's a bajillion feet we're talking 16 17 000 cubic feet of air that we're dealing with here yes yeah so uh I still have I, you have the plans on here. I, I have still have no idea where this is going to be. Is it in the middle of this? So thing? the the big in space the in the middle there. That's yeah. that's what it is. Uh, that that kind of little bit. It is a boulder section. There is the fireplace. So oh, it's, like, it's a big square room yeah. basically, but the, f the going towards the outside wall from the center here, it slow it kind of slowly slopes down, it like changes. Because right, this is an attic space, times. so yeah, and there's windows along the floor at the right because that's the, those are the top windows of the building. That's where but. that's where they shot the murder holes. That's where they <laughs> shot the people when they came to attack the castle. So the main part of this attic has a central fireplace, basically a column in the middle of the room with the fireplace open on three sides. Then it's a kitchen, dining area, and lounge area. All of that is open to a whole other section of the attic. Davide, 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 Davide. 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 Hit the da at the I beginning, heard, I, and then it's I know Davide. It's Italian, so you don't leave off the e at the end. Davide. Okay. Well. Yeah, you've been practicing. I just did this for the first time. Sorry. <laughs> Ari owns a Marantz SR8012 receiver and a set of 7.1.4 Yamo speakers. He would like to reuse those as possible. There's a skylight and windows, and the intention is currently to keep this whole space bright, so it does not seem at all suitable for projection. So what size of t uh, what size for the TV and where should it go? There's a fairly large corner section uh, to the left, opposite the dining area or beside the kitchen, there's a fairly large section of a wall and then a doorway close to the corner. He's already decided on an interesting flat platform section, sectional couch that uses weighted pillows for the backrest so it can basically face any direction. So it's a like a flat couch with n nothing on top, except there is something on top. They're pillows that you can move, mm -hmm. but they're heavy. Yeah. So when you put them there, you can actually lean against That's them. That's right. It's freaking cool is what it is. <laughs> and I do assume that the shape of this sectional couch is not actually like static, that you could conceivably make it a different shape. You can move it around. Yeah, yes. it's, it's in pieces. So yes. I don't think it has to be this sort of Z shape that he's created here. You could reform it. I, I, into... I would imagine so. It looks yeah. like you can. Yeah. Put the thing on casters, man. Change this thing. Yeah. Uh, so where so, so would we put the TV next to the kitchen or one of the walls in the yeah. corner opposite the dining area so okay 
I'm going to be honest. This is a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this, for home this theater. is not like that. You wouldn't walk in and go, oh, this room should be a theater. No, I mean, this is a, I understand you want a TV and a sound system in this room. Totally on yeah. board with that. Uh, but yeah. this isn't like a dedicated theater space whatsoever. Um, no. So, yeah. And then we're going to get to these questions later, but he really doesn't want speakers in this room. <laughs> you know, it's, that much seems totally clear that I mean, he not is not out interested into in having this speakers room. In there. He's fine with having, like, you know, some speakers beside the TV up at the up along right. a wall. Yeah. So uh, this can quickly spiral out of control. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you. This can quickly spiral out of control. And I am of the opinion that we should be very, very practical. Yes. When we are addressing this. Yes. So what you really want is the ability to view TV from time to time and maybe have a good time with a movie. And I am 100% in favor of you doing that. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think that what you what we do is we find the TV that you want, mm -hmm. which I think should be an OLED. Oh, and I think okay. it should, you know, or something along those lines. Uh, and I think we should figure out what wall you want to put it on. And then we'll figure out your speakers based on that. I don't think 7.1.4 is going to happen. Yeah, we can address that this. on the audio side of things. I mean, my, my thinking was this is a big space. I completely agree. I don't know how you would handle a projection set up in here. It doesn't make sense. No. But I'm saying like you get the biggest TV you reasonably can. I would kind of... If you're doing this like soon, I would kind of maybe run out and grab uh, a Sony X900F. They have an 85 sure, inch that sure. is at a reasonable price, but it's full array local dimming. It's HDR. It's Dolby Vision. I think it's the best of the 85 inch TVs that are still available in Europe. I believe it was the XF90, so it's a slightly I, I'm different just model saying number. That I said OLED simply because if I lived in the castle, only an OLED would. But do. 77 and inches is, I mean, well, maybe he does have $30,000 to spend on the 88-inch, but... He's got a castle. The 88-inch can't be wall-mounted or anything, so um, the, I say 85-inch LCD, I think, makes sense here. The, the Sony XF90 is the European model number. That's the one I would go for, because I think you need as big as you can reasonably get. But, I mean, I'm looking at this, and I go, does it, does it go beside the kitchen? Because it certainly could. It could go on the wall that's beside the kitchen. Or does it go more in the corner space that's opposite the dining room? And I kind of think the corner space makes more sense to me. Uh, in fact, so if might... I'm looking at this this diagram here, yeah. it, the, it would be on the bottom left. The bottom left of the, the diagram, that's correct. And I'm almost thinking maybe you actually corner mount this TV and have the whole setup kind of at a 45 degree angle. Angle, I mean, basically facing the way he has the sofa looking in his uh, blueprint type diagram. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. If that were so, you could actually see the TV from the from kitchen. the kitchen it, and from uh, you know you from the dining room as well. The... Yeah. I'm thinking a, a corner setup actually makes a lot of sense in here. Yeah. That's my that's my inclination. I could get behind that. I could get behind yeah. that. Uh, I mean, he's clearly not wanting to like close anything off, or and, and that's I mean, I completely well, yeah. That. I mean, why would you close yeah. any of this type of room off? That uh, it's just yeah. gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. So uh, I could get behind that. I could also get behind to the right of I guess to the right of the the. Uh, fireplace. So, with the dining room, with the kitchen on your left, the dining room. It's well, I mean, so, those are the, on, exactly on the, the two options that you mentioned. So, as far we're not really helping by reiterating. No, we're not. His, his I mean, it's without just, I think in order for us to actually help, we're going to have to be flown out to Italy mm, and take a look at the space for ourselves. But I'm just looking I think at like that's the only reason where thing that we do. where all the seating is in this room, where people will naturally be facing in this room, and to me, all of that is more conducive to looking towards that left corner area. I agree. I, I think the beside the kitchen one feels more like the back of this room. That That's just my right. inclination. I, I, can, I, I agree with yeah. that. So he can't figure out where his side surround speakers would mm -hmm. go. He doesn't want any speakers anywhere in the large opening uh, to the other side of the attic. He doesn't want any speakers standing beside or mounted close to the central fireplace. Making Which things is real kind of where they would go if we... <laughs> so how would we do the speaker layout? He has it in mind that he'd like to do a 7.2.4 configuration. What do we think would be best? I think 2.2. One, maybe. I'm thinking this... five point two. I mean, a... you think five point two? I mean, center speaker that that's that's easy. Where is he going to put a side on the ceiling? In... I I don't do Atlas. Well, I don't know here. if he wants to. Would you want to mount things to those wooden beams up there? 
15 feet, tw- you know, 20 feet I mean, they can, they can be the type that... an average of 15 feet, so you get, those tall ones are probably 20, mm-hmm. 25 feet up. I mean, uh, well, you know what you could do? You know what? Yeah, I'm looking at this. If you're, if you're, if the TV's in the that left corner, like we're talking about, uh, the the wall beside the dining room and the wall beside the kitchen, that's low. So if you had yeah. a surround speaker, basically on the first uh, wooden beam up, yeah, you know that that it's right it, over the dining room table, basically. Uh, well, no, I mean it'd be like like in between the dining room and the kitchen, but on the on the horizontal wooden beam of his ceiling. You could have one there, and then you could have one on the opposite wall, like just to the side of the big opening. Because you're right, like speakers did facing say, straight did, down I, don't make sense, but... So, no, no, he already just said, but you can't figure out... Like, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely saying don't do Atmos in here. Just don't do it. it don't, no, 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 no. This no, isn't no. a room for no. Atmos. Just don't even think about it. 5.2 at most. Is where uh, what I'm saying. Well, okay, so five point two at most. Yeah. We haven't told you where to put the subs yet, because I don't know. Well, that's coming up. <laughs> uh, I, I would, I would, I would be okay with two point one. Yeah. If you went all the way down to two point one, I have a feeling you're gonna have a hard time wanting to put a subwoofer anywhere. If you corner load this TV and you put a piece of furniture there, you could hide the big old sub we're gonna have to get behind the TV. Yeah. So that would, I think that that makes the most sense this space is so large that uh where we're talking about everybody else like oh you know the so the wavelength is longer than your room mm. might not be the case in here a lot so, a, lo- a good portion of the base is not i mean the very deepest 20 hertz frequencies yes but yeah. a good amount of the base is not uh larger than the dimensions of this space yeah so you know i, I First of all, 7.2.4, without uh, giving us any place for us to put the speakers, oh, is d- d- awfully just difficult. Just put that, <laughs> put that out of your mind. Don't do Atmos. Don't do 7 speakers. How do you feel about like drones hovering with speakers on <laughs> well, them? Because that's pretty much how that I'm would have to work. I'm looking at this again. I'm like, actually, instead of, I said the, the first horizontal beam just above uh, the windows. But actually, if you went higher, if you went to that second horizontal beam... That gets you away from everything. Like you're not even really going to be looking at the speaker there, and it could go above the opening doorway. So your your surround speakers are going to be well elevated, but that's okay. I got no problem with that in a yeah. five point two setup, and I think that yeah. keeps the look nicer. It gets them up and out of the way. You're barely even thinking about your surround speakers, but you have them so that you get some surround fill. We absolutely do not want overhead Atmos speakers or surround backs. So is uh, J one twelve Yamo subwoofer is a slotted front slotted port twelve inch model. Obviously, will not pressurize the space. Mm. <laughs> Boy, it there's an not. understatement. <laughs> but he likes the design and the looks. Okay, if you do what I say, you don't have to look at it at all. And any subwoofers in this room will be visible unless you do what I say, in which case you won't be. So should he just get a second one of these, or should he get a pair of different subs? And where should he position the two subwoofers? Um, uh, well, I, I, obviously, I, I, you're right. You're not going to pressurize the space. No. You don't want to pressurize no, the space. You don't That's want not to, no. really an option here. So uh, I think getting too, no offense, but for this space, garbage subwoofers that aren't going to do anything but, you know, Okay. In out and out terms, the J112 themselves. is not garbage, but it is not suitable for yeah. this space. Not for this space. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I'll... I, in a normal home theater, perfectly fine right. sub. I'd be perfectly happy they're, recommending they're you. Somebody says, somebody says, should I subs. upgrade my sub? I would say, you could, but you could not. Right. It, it's up to you. You know, this would not be a thing. But in this space and liking the looks, unfortunately, that's not Yeah, the good. issue here is that, like, if you were to run any kind of room correction auto setup program, it's going to, uh, first of all, it's not even going to be able to set them at a level that will work. And then the poor thing is going to be creating more distortion than anything else. It's right. not going to sound good. It's going to be a bad experience. So this is why you do have to consider the amount of space, even if you're like, I'm not going to crank the base. I'm not going to pressurize the whole thing, but you still want a subwoofer that is at least capable of not distorting in the type of right. space that you have. Now, I mean, we all f- always talk about SVS. You can get SVS in Italy. That's not the issue. Uh, they have some very nice looking subwoofers with a beautiful gloss black or a gloss white finish a gloss white in here might work 
really well. If, if it's going to be as white as it looks, then yeah. And the, the nice thing about fun. the SVS is that even if they are turned up to their maximum, they will not badly distort. They will not bottom out. So that is the type of thing I would certainly consider in here. Uh, they're still not going to pressurize this space, but like I don't think he's getting PB16 ultras, all right? Um, but it would be that type of thing. There are other options in Europe. Um, what is the BK Electric? is um, right. one of the really popular ones, at least in UK. I'm not sure about whether they're how available they are in Italy. Um, but that it, it's going to be that type of thing where you, you need something more capable than the Yamo. Don't just get a second one. That It's not going to be a good experience. It's not a good way to spend your money. Yeah, get a big SVS cylinder, the biggest cylinder you can afford and stick it behind that TV. And then Could do that. A 4,000, a PC 4,000. I mean, it's not going to do 16,000 cubic feet, but it's not going to hurt itself at all. Yeah, yeah. I, you could just throw a, you know, a, a nice sheet over the top right. of it. And, but I, know, I do think like a, knows what a, a gloss white in here would not look out of but place. But where are you going to, so where are you going to put it? I'm saying behind the TV in that behind corner. The TV. And then where are you putting the second one over by that? over I, I, in, I, I mean it really doesn't matter where, not not honest, not particularly i mean we're not we're not dealing with a rectangular space but i mean i i was initially looking at this i would be like what is basically the left and right walls in the diagram because that is sort of central to this whole space um yeah you know so so basically somewhere but those are stairs that are going down we think that's that right may or may not have doors so i mean I, i'd have like it have have somewhere door, along but... the where where we're going to have the tv in the corner and i'd have one on the opposite side uh basically beside his kitchen uh you know on the other side of that uh divider where the fireplace is on the other side of that um beside his kitchen and i think i think a couple of gloss white subs there would look not out of place at all yeah so the four Atmos speakers that he already owns are Yamo's ATM50 upward firing modules that are designed to sit on top of his Yamo towers. Clearly, this attic ceiling uh, does not look appropriate for upward firing. Atmos, mm. do we have any suggestions on that front? Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, we honestly, don't, I, don't would, do Atmos in here. I wouldn't do Atmos at all, yeah. but since you have them, and if you're going to end up still using the towers up front on the either side of your TV, which you may mm -hmm. end up doing... You could throw them up there and see what happens. I mean, I, I really don't <laughs> oh, what, think it's front bouncing heights? off the ceiling anyways. You can make them front heights? Yeah. I mean, the, yeah. these ones, these YAML ones, they aren't the type where you have the option of mounting them on a wall and just using them as angled speakers. These are dedicated. They have to go on top of yeah. a speaker and fire upwards. So uh, there isn't much you can repurpose these ones for. Well, oh you're, oh, you're saying just put them on top of the towers and see what happens, even with the yeah. crazy... <laughs> I guess. <laughs> I don't think the ceiling it makes any difference. Right, it's all the processing. It's all it's all the I processing. I still don't think you're going to so. get very good results with that though. Um it, it costs literally nothing. True. He already They're already them. in hand. I yeah. I suspect you will end up taking them back down. I say don't do Atmos yeah. in this room. So all of his Yamo speakers are the S80 series, which is one step down from their flagship models. He's heard Kef speakers, and he knows that he loves their sound. Do we think the difference in sound quality would be worth it to replace all of his Yamo speakers in favor of Kef? Can I say no? I think I want to say no. I mean, no. that's my inclination. The, the, I, one, the, I, I, the one thing I, I would say is that if you were considering something like the R series, again, yeah, in yeah, the yeah, gloss yeah. white finish, like everything in this room is gloss white now, and they have that, like, this is a room where Kef's super square 90 degree angle cabinets like they're gonna look good in this room because right. that's what this room right. already is is square white 90 degree angles except for the ceiling which gives it this amazing look so in an aesthetic and then sense, that's why the couch looks so good too is because right. it's this big curved couch thing which yeah. could, totally stands out so it, in an aesthetic sense i think something like gloss white kef speakers could look spectacular in here and they do have the type of wall mountable speakers that could go right on that beam on the ceiling and above the entryway and would work really well and i'm saying you're only going to get five of them you're not going to get nine or eleven of them so in that sense, this is definitely a situation where I would buy something based on looks. Yep. You know, yep. because there's just so much, so much going on here, and the the sound quality. I mean, we're we're talking about so many compromises are for sound quality because of aesthetics, and right. I've got no problems with it. I just can't say it strongly enough. I'm. This is not an insult. This is like if you gave me this room and said. You know, make it sound good. I'd be like, no, I don't want to do that. This place is amazing. I'm not going to make it right. sound good. Like to me, I have to put, put, fill the ceiling with insulation. Have you lost your mind? Like, I, I, <laughs> I think the Yamo speakers look nice in and of themselves. But like, 
skinny black towers in here. I'm like, no, it doesn't work with the aesthetics of this room at all. Nothing yeah. else in this room looks like that. So yeah. uh, purely aesthetics alone. And then you already know you love the Kef sound, which believe me, I'm in agreement there. So in that Especially sense... Especially if you're going for the R series, for sure. Yeah, yeah. In that sense, I could, uh, I could get on board with that, not just because of the sound, but because it also works in other ways. Yeah, it would have that. You would have to, if you're fine with them being black towers on either side sure. of this. I mean, I've been like so the uh, the Bang and Olfson uh, people when I was out there, they took us out to uh, the 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 news people who were there, the journalists. I guess I was considering a journalist back then. They took us to like the Bang and Olfson traditional home, mm -hmm. like the farm where they started. Right, and they had it was this old, you know, traditional farmhouse with Bang and Olufsen crap all over it. And I love Bang and Olufsen. I mean, I love the way it looks, but it looks so out of place in there. <laughs> and putting a black tower, a Yamo Tower, in this room seems a little sacrilegious to me. Yeah. So I could totally get behind buying something white just because it was white. And making sure you get something that you like the way it sounds is also oh, yeah. important. The, the concentric driver configuration of the of the uh, kefs It'll work would also not be a bad mix for this type of room where we are probably dealing with some highly reflective. And they have the uh, angle wall mountable type that would work really well for the surround yeah. speaker places. So it all comes up working really well. I mean, if somebody walks into this room and they see those kef gloss white speakers and some gloss white subwoofers in the positions we said, they're going to be like, it looks like these speakers were custom made for this room. Yeah, it's for this totally space. totally going to yeah. work. <laughs> Assuming that the renderings we're seeing, because they look more like renderings yeah, than pictures, are, but, yeah. are, uh, are accurate as far as what mm. the color. I mean, he may want to paint the whole thing pink. We don't know. So for running speaker wire con connections, is there anything he should do to try and make those uh, wire runs future-proof? For example, do we think most speakers will eventually be self-powered and make use of Ethernet connections instead of traditional speaker wire? Dude, do not overthink that. Nah. Just put... You know, I mean, if you really want to be crazy, you can get 12 gauge wire and put, you know, run 12 gauge <laughs> wire to this stuff. Or if you really want to be crazy, you could run 10 gauge wire and risk not being able to terminate it at, you know, bare wire connection because it's too thick. I mean, since I'm but, saying that, I mean, first of all, we've greatly simplified your setup. So, I mean, yeah. the, the speaker wire running to your front speakers shouldn't be a gigantic problem unless you're for some reason going to put your gear in some really strange place but you've got this whole area of the corner that i think you can have an equipment stand somewhere there so that speaker wire is like nothing here nor there that uh so it's really only the two surround speakers and i would suggest uh strongly considering some ghost wire uh the flat speaker wire that you can adhere, because it's self-adhesive, adhere to your walls to get to the two surround positions that I'm suggesting, because it looks like he could go in between the ceiling rafters and like actually behind those horizontal wooden slats. Um, you know, if it's completely flat speaker wire, I think, I think that's doable. I don't know, it might not be, but in any case, I think ghost wire, uh, flat speaker wire to get to those two positions makes sense. But other than that, like, no, don't, don't worry about future speakers being self-powered ethernet driven like no speakers and, and amplifiers are going to be around for a long you buy time to come gloss white kef speakers and put them in here they're going to be there until mm -hmm. the ceiling that they fall off the ceiling so uh it's been two hours but yes. we're gonna do one more because it's, it's a single question cool. and rob's gonna answer it and then we can go on with our lives so Chris. Chris is the fellow who has a TV in his bedroom that is a mere inches from his face right beside his bed since he is visually impaired. He's been using a 24-inch Samsung TV from several years ago. He's feeling like it's showing its age now. He uses his Apple TV 4K a lot, and he'd like to experience 4K and HDR. And I'm I, I'm not trying to sound insensitive, but I'm. it seems like upgrading for somebody who has a visual impairment, I'm glad that you're, you're wanting to upgrade uh, and that you're wanting to experience this. I'm just wondering how that works i, guess, I mean the 4k sort of probably question. not but hdr is certainly still going to be visible sure if it's that's and maybe HDR. that could really really that could be the thing that makes yeah. the difference for him is the fact that there's going to be these brightness differences mm -hmm. that are something that he's going to be able to pick out a lot mm -hmm. more readily than maybe he would have before so you know i, I think this is a, a a use case where hdr the importance of hdr really comes to the forefront uh, there don't seem to be any high quality TVs in small sizes these days. He was thinking a 27 inch would be perfect, but any normal TVs that that small are low resolution, no no HDR, and pretty crappy looking LCDs. Mm -hmm. So what about a computer monitor? He's got a separate surround sound system, so audio sound side of things is no problem. And there certainly appear to be quite a few 27 inch computer monitors that can do, well at least say they can do 4K and HDR. Is there any reason to avoid using a computer monitor for this application? And if not, is there a particular model we monitor? Ugh. 
man, it's getting late. It is. We would uh, suggest for him. Uh, so I, I had a I had this come up recently uh, when I was randomly talking to a guy who was complained that uh, he had bought a TV that wasn't a TV. Right. I'm like when you bought mean? a monitor. Yeah. He bought a monitor. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. No, that, it, no it speakers, has speakers, no tuner. It doesn't have a tuner. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it doesn't even have speakers. Uh, sometimes they do. Dog, what are you doing? So, uh, is there a reason why you couldn't, you shouldn't use a, t- a monitor for uh, a display? Well, a lot of times, you know, they're built simply, you know, to do text and other things uh, very, very brightly. And they're not as accurate mm. as mm. TVs can be. So that's one of the things we're going to be concerned about when we give you, when Rob gives you his recommendations, since I clearly have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> but that's what that's what we're going to be worried about more than anything. You know, a lot of times they have a bunch of features that you're never going to use, like all the different refresh rates and things, you know, and the ability to change, uh, to take in a bunch of different types of inputs that you're never going to use, like RGB straight or, you know, DVI or something like that, uh, display port. But, uh, you know, these are sort of the things that we'd be concerned about, and local dimming too. That's mm-hmm. not, not necessarily something that's going to be standard on a, a monitor. So we're going to have to look for a pretty special monitor, I would think, uh, if we're going to be able to give you one that is uh, that will do the everything you want to do and still be a good mon- a, a good display for you. Right. So what do you think, Rob? Yeah. So I what I want to warn everyone, Chris included, but everybody, is that when it comes to computer monitors, uh, in one way, thankfully, Visa the VESA, the same group where you see the Visa right. mounting, the standardized yeah. mounting, they came up with a standardization for computer monitors for HDR. They call it display HDR for computer monitors, and they gave different numbers. They gave HDR 400, 500, 600, 1000, 1400, and now they have one specifically for OLEDs that they call uh, display HDR true black, because OLEDs can do true black and LCDs can't. But uh, they've got these specifications. Now, the problem is that a ton of HDR, so-called display HDR, computer monitors, including the ones that Chris linked to because he found a couple on Monoprice that he was like, are these any good? The vast majority are the display HDR 400 rating. And that Mm. is what I would normally call HDR compatible, but not capable. It's Mm. not just that they're only rated to 400 nits. I'm not worried about that. It's that they are... 8-bit, they're not 10-bit, so it's not really a true HDR rendering because HDR requires at least 10-bit precision so that you don't get posterization and banding. It is barely more than standard color. It's barely more than Rec. 709 color. It's technically wider, so they get to call it HDR, but it's really not the DCI color that you're hoping for. Um, And the display HDR 400 displays do not have to have local dimming. They can be just a regular backlight or edge lit. None of these things are good. None of these things are what you want. And unfortunately, that is the majority of display HDR computer monitors. You want one that is at least display HDR 600 or higher. I mean, 1000 would be great, but those are expensive and there are very, very few of, a few of them. But there's a reasonable number of display HDR 600 displays. And that's where I'm going to point you. The reason I'm willing to do that is because one of the monoprice displays that he sent to me as a link asking if it was any good, it was display HDR 400, but the price was over $400. So I'm like, well, if if you're considering that, then we can get you something in that price range Mm. that'll work here. What I'm going to say is because you want this to be a TV, and not just a computer monitor, I want you to get one with a VA panel, a vertically aligned LCD panel. Those are the ones that have inherently better black levels, inherently better contrast, as long as you're viewing them straight on, but we know he's not viewing his from the sides. So the IPS panels that most of these are don't have as good black levels, don't have as high native contrast, Uh, but I want you to get a VA panel, I want you to get local dimming, and I want you to get an HDR 600. So Samsung is gonna be the answer, They have a model called the CHG70 that on Amazon you can get for $400. So it's in a price range that I think he's willing to consider. It's the size he wanted. It's all the features I want you to have. The one weird thing is that it's curved. (laughs) It's a very mild curve, but it is a curved display, but we know he's like practically nose to screen the way that he views it. I... I genuinely believe in this instance, the curve will not be a problem. 
Um, so it's a little weird that it's slightly curved, but it's okay. It has HDMI inputs. I mean, it has DisplayPort as well, but it has HDMI inputs. They are normal HDMI 2.0 inputs. So it'll work with your normal sources. Um, to me, it checks all the boxes. Samsung, CHG70, and the 27-inch size. There you go. All right, who do we have left? We have Scott S., Damien D., uh, scrolling down a little bit here, Nathan D., and Chris M. We'll answer you next All week, right. gentlemen. Got through, got through a good chunk. So we want to thank our uh, 108 patrons over at patreon.com. And we want to thank Chris for talking us up to SVS. We certainly do. Patreon.com slash Podcast. If you'd like to sign up, think of it as a voluntary subscription to our podcast. 108 patrons over there. Thanks so much. Do want to mention, if you come to avrant.com, over on the right-hand side, there is a cup of coffee logo and it says support avrant. If you want to give a one-time donation, that's how you do it. It'll take you to PayPal. And you can either use your PayPal account or just a credit card. You don't even have to sign up and it won't keep dinging you every month. It'll be a one-time thing if you want to do that. Also, thanks to Chris M for talking is up to SVS. If you want to get your question answered on this podcast, all you have to do it. Did I say podcast? Yeah, you did. It felt like I said podcast, but it didn't That's what I heard. Anyway. We both might be wrong. All right, well, let's go back to the tape. Uh, if you want to get your question answered, just ask by emailing us at question at avrant.com. For AV Rant, I'm Tom Andrew. And I'm Rob H. Now go out and listen to something. Want your question answered? Send it to question at avrant.com. is A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.